Thank you. Kindly be seated. Before we begin, a short housekeeping. As you exit the Grand Salle to your right, washroom for the ladies, to your left, the gents. I am John Dong from National Library Service. At this time, I'd like to call on our director, Mrs. Jennifer Yard, to give the welcome. Mrs. Yard. His Excellency David Commission, Ambassador to CARICOM, Ms. Sharon Drayton, Deputy Permanent Secretary, Prime Minister's Office, Division of Culture, Moderator, Dr. Den Derek Murray, Director, Center for Hybrid Studies, our panelists this evening, the Honorable Sandra Husbands, Minister of State and Foreign Trade and Business, Dr. Don Marshall, Director of the, of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies, Salises, Mr. Mohammed Nasser, entrepreneur, advocate for economic empowerment of the black man. Mr. Adrian Elcock, director, Elcock Group of Companies. Mrs. Esther Masco, director, Great Kids Arity. Members of the media, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you here today at the Courtney Blackman Grand Salle, Central Bank of Barbados, and today's panel discussion, Black Business in Barbados, Struggles, Successes, Future. I wish to offer special thanks to the Central Bank for collaborating with the library and hosting this event. This is evening's panel discussion forms part of a celebration for Heritage Month, but serves to highlight 175 years of public library service in Barbados. I believe that this event is timely, especially in this changing times of economic development in Barbados. Entrepreneurship and economic development are intimately related. The entrepreneurial process is a major factor in economic development, and the entrepreneur is the key to economic growth. Being involved in entrepreneurship is indeed the way forward. Today, libraries face new realities and in their mission to remain reliable and a trusted source of information provision. Small businesses need information about the industries and the National Library Service is well equipped to provide resources that can help an entrepreneur that already has a business or is, or is in the process of starting one. Before people can go to a bank for financing, they need a business plan. How they do, do they do it? Where do they go? The library should be the place. The library is one of the best resources for local businesses with collections in print, non-print and online and competent library staff to help with the information needs. We also provide space to meet and study, free wireless internet, printers, scanners, and computers. We have to be proactive in making the business community aware of the resources available that can help them to succeed and to grow our local economy. I am encouraged by the conversations that are undergoing in society regarding the concrete steps that need to take place to address black business development in Barbados and today's discussion is just one example. By listening to our guest panelists, I hope you will see that there are many doors to success, some just waiting to be explored. I believe that black business deserves equal opportunity to succeed, and I am conscious that we cannot do it alone. I hope that as you share your lived experiences this evening, each one will teach one and inspire one another to keep pushing for what we, you want and work better for a better environment for the prosperity of black business, for black business people. But ultimately, the goal of this discussion is to focus on the road ahead for black business and to address some of the unique challenges faced and discuss solutions and practical advice to help along the way. To the panelists, thank you in advance for sharing your insights about the successes, challenges, and what the future holds for black business in Barbados. And to the audience, both in-house and virtual, we look forward to a robust discussion this evening and I hope that you will find this experience a very rewarding one. Thank you. Thank you, Director. At this point, I'd like to, to call on the Deputy Permanent Secretary, in the, in the Prime Minister's Office with Responsibility for Culture, Mrs. Sharon Drayton. H 
His Excellency David Comichon, Ambassador to CARICOM, Ms. Jennifer Yard, Director of the National Library Service, Moderator Dr. Derek Murray, Director of Center for Hybrid Studies, and the panelists, the Honorable Sandra Husbands, MP, Minister of State in Foreign Trade and Business, Dr. Don Marshall, Director of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies, Mr. Mr. Mohammed Nasser, entrepreneur, advocate for economic empowerment of the black man, Mr. Adrian Elcock, director, Elcock Group of Companies, Mrs. Esther Maskell, director, Great Kids Arete, members of the media, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I've been asked to give this presentation on behalf of the Senator Doctor, the Honorable Chantal Monroe Knight, Minister in the Prime Minister's Office, who will be arriving a little later as she has a prior engagement. It is indeed a privilege and a pleasure to make a few remarks for Heritage Month on this panel discussion, Black Business in Barbados Struggles, Successes, Future. It is commendable that the National Library Service, Prime Minister's Office Culture, took this initiative to raise the awareness of the role of black business in Barbados by highlighting their contribution to economic development. Forums like these are, signif are significant as they serve to fulfill the library's mandate to inform, guide, educate, and to empower the people of Barbados, while simultaneously showcasing our national heritage. The month of June, Heritage Month, is an important milestone on the Division of Cultures calendar because it is a time to celebrate, recognize, and inform the public about the culture, traditions, histories, art, and the contributions of Barbadians. And it is a reminder of the significant role they play in national development. Today, the National Library Service remembers the contribution of black business owners in Barbados, the businesses they created and guided to success, but oftentimes to failure as well. And that's not unusual for businesses, startups. They have a, a, you know, a pretty high failure rate, but both success and failures, we, we have to commend. Dr. Hedden Security reminded us that in the colonial flurry of the first half of the 20th century, Barbadian businessmen fought against the pulling tide of King Sugar to forge their own paths and thus permanently alter the face of business in Barbados. Their, their story is befitting to be highlighted on this occasion. The panel discussion this evening is indeed an eclectic one as it allows us to draw on a broad range of experiences and evidence from small business owners, government officials, and members of the academic community as they seek to explore the challenges faced by black businesses and identify promising approaches to address their needs. Black business in Barbados have been breaking new ground for many years seeking new paths and new solutions for the world of business. They have made an impact in areas such as manufacturing, agriculture, service, construction, and transportation, to name a few. Not all have become corporate giants, but they have exhibited leadership in their field in some significant way. It is no secret that the past few years, especially during the pandemic, it has been a difficult one for many black businesses. Some of them have faced a reduction in sales and sales revenue, elevated uncertainty, and tight credit market conditions. Many black business owners have had to lay off employees or close businesses altogether. Many potential entrepreneurs with plans to start new businesses had to put them aside. But then you had others who actually started businesses in this time as well. Between stay-at-home orders and forced closures and change and, and changing policies and safety protocols and all those things, you know, managing households for women and so on, you know, women had their own special challenges. 
The issues that will be discussed this evening are critical to everyone who has an interest in the success of black business and by extension, our economy as a whole. I am assured that we will agree to disagree on some of these issues. But nevertheless, the dialogue itself will be of great value to everyone. We look forward to an open and lively discussion. And on behalf of the Prime Minister's Office Culture and the National Library Service, we just encourage you know, an engaging discussion this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Reardon. At this time, I'd like to turn the evening's proceedings over to our moderator, Dr. Derek Murray. Dr. Murray, up to you and your panel, sir. Thank you very much, John, and welcome, everyone. And congratulations on celebrating your 175th anniversary. <laughs> and congratulations on another year of these excellent seminars and panel discussions. For those who don't know, this is not the first for the library. This is something that they do every year um, to educate and enlighten. <clears throat> and I'm always pleased to be a part of, of their seminars and lectures and presentations. So this evening, we will be discussing the struggles, successes, and future of black business after 56 years of independence, at the beginning of a new republic, in the middle of a pandemic, and another major European war, and at the tipping point of irreversible climate change. Uh, so this is an opportunity for us to soberly reflect on the past and to visualize our future reality as a nation. I'm Derek Murray, and I will introduce the panelists. To my far right is Professor Don Marshall at the other end of the table. Um, he's a research director at UE Sir Arthur Lewis Institute for Social and Economic Studies, and his specialty is international political economy, along with um, finance and global finance. Uh, so those are his research areas. Um, sitting to his left is entrepreneur, businessman, Mohammed Nasser, activist. Um, he introduced himself as an advocate for economic empowerment of the black man. And um, if I, I suspect everyone here knows Mohammed and his work. And many of you will know his early successes in business as well. Um, to his left is the Honorable Sandra Husband, a Member of Parliament, Minister of State in the Ministry of Foreign Trade and Business. And that's the introduction, that's in, um, the, what you will see on the flyer, but she, before that, before being a minister, she is an activist as well in terms of small businesses. She worked for long years with the Small Business Association, and she was a business, she was and probably still is a businesswoman in her own right. Uh, Mr. Adrian Elcott, from director of the Elcott Group of Companies, a uh, businessman, uh, and a quiet activist, and uh, a patron of the arts. If you're an artist, a visual artist, you will know Adrian Elcott, and he gives generously to the art community. But he as well is an activist. Um, in, in the, for the empowerment of black businesses and support small business, um, small entrepreneurs whenever he has the opportunity. Uh, to my immediate right is Esther Mask, Mrs. Esther Maskell um, of Great Cakes Arit. I had, I had to look up how you, um, how you say that word, Arit, Arete. That's not what they told me on Google. But, so they teach me not, not to trust Google. Um, and uh, she runs a nursery school 
um, a primary school, and she does both online and face-to-face um, -face classes. And so she's a young entrepreneur, and I'm particularly pleased that we have a young face um, on the panel. So we'll jump straight into it. We lost a few minutes. I was speaking about me, you know, so I, oh, oh. <laughs> I met you, I met you, Esther. Um, so we'll jump straight into it. It's, we'll have a conversational type of informal um, panel discussion. Uh, so I'll start with a little bit of history. Um, Dr. Henderson Carter, the authority on the history of business in Barbados, or one of the authorities on the history of business in Barbados, in his paper on black resistance to hegemony through business, a copy of which is in the book, like the package that you have, and which can also be found online. He's certain that there is no doubt, and this is quoting him, there is no doubt that whites had firm control over elements of the business sector during the period 1900 to 1966. He goes on to summarize as follows. The majority of the blacks were, the majority of the banks were foreign banks. Most of the insurance, com insurance companies were white managed and owned. Most of the commission agencies were white managed and owned. Most of the sugar plantations and factories were white owned and managed. The two foundries were white owned and managed. And the newspapers and the radio station were largely white owned. Thus, whites controlled critical areas such as capital, insurance, food imports, sugar production, and export, engineering, and the media in a society where over 95% of the population was black and still is black. So we will jump straight into um, the discussion with the panel. And my first question, to the panel, and I'll ask um, Mohammed Nasser and Adrian to lead off in um, this answer. Uh, in your opinion, does the white community still dominate the economy in the manner just described? <laughs> you get straight to the heart of the matter. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, praise you so much. First, let me say that. For those of you who do not know who I am, because a lot of things you're hearing now, you, you believe that that's who I am. That's only part of who I am. So let me say that there, from the time I had sense, I discovered that there's serious disadvantage okay. between black people and white people in Barbados. And from a young person, I realized that if I really want to make it in Barbados, I could have make it easily, which I did. But one day, I went to New York, and I met a man by the name of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And he came to Barbados after having some problems with Trinidad. At that time, I used to control the Caribbean. I mean, it was first name, basis of every lady in the Caribbean. I said, Dominica. I never liked them airplanes going through Dominica. So I want to say this. I went to Trinidad after Eric uh, Williams decided that Farrakhan must not speak in Trinidad. And I flew into Trinidad. And I went and had a talk with Eric uh, Williams' cousin, who was then the brigadier, and telling him that Farrakhan must speak. So. He tell me, hold on, he called it, uh, the, he called um, Eric Williams, and uh, he tell me, I'll call you, no, he tell me, give him the number for the pair booth. There are no friends there. So he called me back in about five minutes and tell me, go and let one of the officers show you who is head of security. Everything is all right. Minister Lewis Farrakhan will be able to speak. So I went and I told Minister Farrakhan, who did not know me, that he would be able to speak. And I, the police, when I was walking, the, the head of security they said, who are you, young man? You can left Barbados and come to Trinidad and get Eric Williams to change the money. You must be some powerful fella. 
So I didn't pay attention to that, but that's what I want to say that I want to pay attention to. The only message was for when I came to Barbados. And when he came to Barbados, he told me that he wanted to go into the prison. And this is, you better listen to what I'm saying real good now. He said he wanted to go into the prison. So I tell him, all right, so in those days, anything I wanted to do, I could get done. So I took him to get the prison arrangement set up, took him into the prison. And we stopped there for about three hours. The only place that I see on earth, and I travel a lot, that is cleaner than, than Glendale Prison was Singapore. And when we came out after about three hours from the prison, he told me, stop. The car used to drive a Lincoln Continental, my wife, a Cadillac Seville. So I want you to understand carefully who this man is. And he told me, stop the car, and I stopped the car. And he said to me, let me tell you something. You know why I want to go into prison with you? If you really want to fight for black people, you have to prepare to go to prison. Because you have to love black people more than black people love themselves if you want to help them. And I said to Minister Louis Farrakhan, I am prepared to go to prison. This country must change. Y'all will not believe this neither, but I've been before the court about 50 times already, and the Prime Minister father got me off all 50 times, and it was for doing nothing but challenging the system. Now, that's a fact. Anyway, I'm a businessman. I went to trade, and, and, and I want people to understand that we can make our people successful. Well, I Pardon me? Well, we're going to get to all the questions, but okay. the one they want okay. you to answer. Okay, so I just want to. Okay, so the one they want you to answer for me is: yeah. um, Do you think that the, okay. the 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 economy is still dominated by the white? Oh, I mean, one million percent. As a matter of fact, honestly, with all respect to the minister side of me, I think it is more dominated now. I sorry, but I have to say the truth. Uh, Adrian. We, because the night is going to be short when we when we look at it. So Adrian, no, what's well, your well, what's your? I did not say why it is more dominated. I yeah, we'll get to that. Very good. <laughs> yeah, I think the simple answer is yes. Uh, whether you say white or non-black, mm -hmm. you know, the answer is that the economy is not controlled by the body or group of people that are the majority of the population. And if you look at the various sectors, whether it's energy, uh, food, tourism you'll see that there is a dominance in those sectors. And once you can control the, the key sectors of an economy, I think you would have to conclude that there is dominance mm -hmm. by non-black business groups in the country. But primarily, uh, specifically to your question, the white business group still has, through its um, plantocratic inheritance, I should say, uh, mm -hmm. the capital to disperse in those particular industries. And Professor Marshall, do we have actual research that, that speaks to the, the relative dominance? Yes, I can draw on research produced by Jonathan Lashley. I can draw on research produced by Sid uh, Carter and uh, it would be Cecilia Karch. Uh, this would be Henderson Carter and Cecilia Karch. Uh, Alfred Watts did a PhD studies, a lecture in management, um, also speaking to, to this. Um, and you go back to Harry Beckel's 1989 Mutual Affair, although that might be dated, there is, a, a, you get sneak insights into the, the fabric of ownership and patterns of ownership in, in, in Barbados, and um, the old language used to be that, as agents say, if you control the commanding heights of the economy, or you dominate, um, then it, could, it is to say that you continue to dominate the economy. I want to add a little nuance, though. I think the economy, there are broader domains of economic activity that marks 2022 Barbados from, say, 1962 Barbados, right? Mm -hmm. There are broader domains of economic activity for which there is a wider base of par participation involving black people. Um, but when it comes to critical areas of the economy, import trading, uh, insurance, banking, construction, 
you could go on to list some real estate prospecting, certainly. Um, you have a situation where there is a dominant uh, white and East Indian fraction, fractions that are part of that, and some blacks. And the influence of all conservative, um, the all conservative elite still remains strong. Uh, I don't want to to reduce it though to um, just simply whitewashing, <laughs> mm -hmm. whitewashing who dominates Barbados now because there are elements of um, other ethnic groups that also form part of that, and and are in lockstep with the white conservative elites. And, and, and when I say in lockstep, I refer to a situation where it is not just the business, they not, they not only have share similar enterprise horizons, but their influence even on uh, banks, government policy, and sometimes it's kind of strong, it's a, it's a preponderant influence on what, what businesses work what business does not work, what kind of entrepreneurship will fail, what kind of entrepreneurship will succeed. And those influences have a permeating cultural effect on people and how they advise their children about what is possible to do entrepreneurship-wise, career-wise, and so on. So um, in essence, we're talking about um, some shifts and some changes, but essentially it, the basic um, structure of the Barbados economy remains dominated by uh, a traditional elite and a new age elite that are in lockstep ideologically and, if, and, and with them and with their outlook. So insider trading, for example, Hillary Beckles talks about insider trading, trading and, and, and talks about the dominance of corporate capitalism, uh, corporate white capital. At that time in 1989, he didn't mean that everybody that was involved on different boards of these important companies were all white, but uh, we knew that the blacks that were involved and so on also shared their same, the same conservative uh, uh, low risk enterprise outlook that they did so. Okay, so I want to follow up with a more nuanced um, and drill, uh, verge into that question and drill down a little bit um, because someone may say, okay, the majority of white capital, the white businesses and so on, inherited that, um, that wealth as a result, regardless of how they got it, colonialism, um, enslavement, so on, but they inherited it. But it, it is incidental that the, 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 the people involved in the business are family and happen to be white, but it is not that, that racial discrimination is practiced in the conduct of business, if you're following what I'm saying. Mm. So is it a case of, okay, this just, it just happens that the families are white and so on, and obviously you will involve your family in business, or is there still today active racial discrimination that informs business decisions? Anyone can answer the question. <laughs> this country is the greatest country you ever had come to call words. White people dominate this country, period. And they dominate every government that we change in this country. This family talk and thing is all nice. The truth is that our people in this country, which include white people and Indians and Chinese who were born in, in the Gulf yeah. The, the white establishment is afraid of expansion by black people in this country because they will swamp them if they allow it to. If they allow black people to have the same freedom and rights that they have, we will swamp them. They have no more brain than us. They are not more intelligent than us. We are all brilliant minds in this country, black, white, Chinese, Jew. But they control the wealth of this country. They control the finance and you put it real nice yes no but they got it because of <laughs> slavery they got it because of slaughtering and killing black people to get what they achieve i'm not here to play no games i want to see justice and fair play in this country and i 
have left against white people for every talking reality, let's talk reality. They did not achieve it by no love. They achieve it by slaughtering people and destroying people and even considering black people as cattle to achieve it. Now, all that has happened. The time has come now for white people to sit down, and instead of trying to dislike people like me and the others who will fight, to sit with us and find a way how we could find a solution to solve this problem. What they want to do is to destroy people like me so they could drive fear as they have in all y'all in here and the people in the country that black. We don't need that. We need to have a discussion now where we sit down. Let, let, let me say something quick here. You see that building there with Ms. Round? I remember when the heat was really on that my sons decided to sell that business to a group of black people at that time for about a million dollars. $800,000. And I was at the meeting there with the family. He said, yeah, we can buy, we can buy. But you know where any money was to put, when it was going to guarantee money to buy, not one fell out of the NASA went there. I didn't NASA then. Went there. No. Then, Sir, Sir, Sir David Seals, when he was moving from Robert Street, and there's something psychological got to be checked in this country. Sir David Seals was giving that building to us for about $250,000. The brothers say, yes, yes, yes. But when the money was to go up, again, they did not put up the money. Care Hunt Building in Robert Street, a group of black fellas bought it. And they had a good deal because the government rented the place for years. And they took all that money from the place and used it for themselves. Some want to were still working in there and they would not pay rent, and that place was sold. What I want to say to these people in here, that there's something psychological with black people, that they feel if they talk to get wealth, that the white people will go after them. Because that's the only conclusion I come to. We have a problem where we must, and let's repeat this quick and I finish, we must get white people to understand that we must have a discussion, and that they must do make some kind of contribution to the development of our people to say try to destroy people like Mohammed Nasser. Mm -hmm. I agree with um, Mohammed to the most part that there needs to be an honest conversation about race relations in Barbados and I think it's something that we have skirted around for many years. We have had commission after commission but then nothing really comes out of it. But the to the point of the question I don't know if it's racial discrimination if it's fair or what have you but I do believe that there are attempts by some to control the, the growth of black businesses in Barbados. I think there, there seems to be some insidious approach whereby you must be kept in your place for the most part. Sometimes it's not a view of, okay, that you haven't gained wealth, et cetera, et cetera. My family has done well. We have had great relationships with some business companies in this island, white, black, Indian, etc. 61 years we've been able to make it thus far. But the reality is when you try to go to a different level, you start seeing some signs that suggest that you're not allowed to be in that sphere. Why? I don't know. Mr. Nasser is probably more equipped and more eloquent in his language to, to articulate such. But what I can say I can give an example. I, I have a friend who is a black businessman who is probably one of the only black businessmen in the country post Rayside to get heavily involved in the capital infrastructure of the country. <clears throat> and under both governments, I realize that he experienced obstacle after obstacle in getting projects awarded or being able to, to uh, execute those projects, et cetera. Now, I remember one former prime minister telling me that the reason why they were willing to keep him at the table is because he has delivered. So it wasn't an issue of competence. He's delivered. But then after that, it just seems as if when he gets to the table, powers that be, governmental and non-governmental, put these obstacles in the way. Why? <clears throat> because there's a, 
economic elite, to use Don's phrase, um, that may feel threatened if that ecosystem that supports them is burst. But it cannot be right because we are 166 square miles. We are just shy of 300,000 people. And for Barbados to thrive, all business needs to thrive. And the key, the key reality is we've investi invested in free education. We've educated our people. But respectfully to all the governments, I don't think we have built an infrastructure to, um, let's say, employ the educated. So we end up with more graduates than we can absorb in the capital structures. So the only way out for them is to really get into some form of business for their own. But then, when they get to that point of reality where they realize they've gotten the education, the dream is not always real, they then have the other questions that you're going to ask that so I wouldn't trespass on, the issues of access to capital, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll segue for you to allow you to get there. The reality is we've educated our people, but we don't have an economy big enough right now to absorb those people. And we don't talk honestly about it. So the only way out is that they have to work for themselves. If not, we're going to have a brain drain. Like we've seen other islands or countries in the region, those young, bright minds will leave us. And we're, we saw it in the pandemic. I have spoken to a few. I have a good young man that's somewhat of a mentee to me. And he's an economist. And he was telling me that the majority of his group 25, 26, are seeking opportunities outside of Barbados. Now, our country cannot thrive unless we keep those minds there. What Minister Monroe Knight was doing in her last job, and hopefully will do in the cultural sector in this job, and what my brother John would have done, we need these young minds to flourish. But it's kind of unknown for some of us. I'm 53, and I don't necessarily have the aptitude or what have you to understand how I can flourish in a cultural sphere, but I'm willing to support it. But some of them do, my daughter, etc. So I think, the long story short, yes, there's been a stem stemming of black business, some will say deliberately. And I think to some degree, some governments have facilitated that foolishness, rather than do what government should do constantly facilitate and level the playing field for all businesses to thrive, and then it will embrace all of the educated education that we have given them. Well, I just want to add, thank you very much. I just want to add a couple of um, perspectives. The history has taught us that when people are dominant, they don't readily give up those positions, and they will defend attempts to remove or change that dominance. That's just a reality. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not necessarily a color thing either. As long as you're dominant, you're going to try to hold it. What Barbados faces is, yes, we have that problem on the ground in relation to our economic landscape, but that is replicated also internationally and globally that small nation states and developing states, and the majority of them are non-white, are constantly struggling against the dominant economies. So it's the same pattern, <coughs> the same pattern of behavior, and it makes it very, very difficult to break out your economy. Now, Barbados is 300,000 people. You cannot build strong enterprises on 300,000 people unless you have a program, a deliberate program of exporting and growing regionally, your enterprises will always be vulnerable in their own domestic space. And this is despite the protections that we give. In the ministry where I am, that's what we do. Our job is to be able to see how we can protect the domestic enterprises, promote the export of trade, 
and at the same time try to balance that against the obligations we have at the WTO. We just lost a major battle at the WTO in relation to fisheries. But it isn't time to talk about that tonight, but I will speak about that because it hurt me to see what we're going to have to cope with now as a nation. Now, when your enterprises and your entrepreneurs are risk averse, so here you have this dominant group, they're very comfortable in the domestic space. You can make more money simply by charging more to the consumer who is a captive in the space because they do not have choices. And you do not have to go out to export, to expand, that the cake can expand. And then as um, Mr. Elcock so ably shared, he said you have these very talented people who if the economy is not growing, it cannot absorb their skills in the growing enterprises, so they start an enterprise of their own. But in 300, among 300,000 people, the chances of survival are, are, are not very, very good. So unless you have people who are export-oriented, this is where the problem is. And if you've got these risk-averse, dominant persons, you don't get the expansion that is needed. Hence, you will see that one of the things we've been focused on as a government, for example, and this is something that I champion within foreign trade, is that we have to be able to use the regional market to create a bigger space. What does that mean for a young entrepreneur? That when you birth yourself, you have to be thinking export and region all at the same time. Now, unfortunately, the mindset across the region is the same. This is the, this is the challenge we have. So that when we struggle in CSME and in Quartet and heads of government to get the, 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 the governments to come together, look, we have to build a better space for the entrepreneurs. We got to deal with telecoms. You got to deal with access to finance. And you're identifying all these things. But then you have this timidity about actually doing these things. And if you don't do them, you will keep choking your entrepreneurs. So while I agree with um, what the doctor said in relation to, yes, there has been some movement, but that dominance is still there. There has been some movement. We've seen it. And we have to thank people like Mohammed who fought the fight and raised their voices when everybody else was quiet and silent. And it's because they raised their voices and they kept noise that a number of things started being pushed, but you would get the pushback. There's no two ways about that. But there has been some progress. And if you look, I, I was so taken with the, the information in here about the, the, the persons that made it. I made notes of a whole set of people who are making it better now than back when Mohammed started but there's still a long way to go. And part of that has to be changing our thinking as a people. This is what is humbugging us, because as Mohammed said, the Indians, and I think the professor also said, that Indians have been able to get in and move. They aren't getting a better break than we are. So what is it that we need to do differently? So th there are a number of factors that are playing that we need to work on and correct in order to be able to move this needle forward. Thank you. Okay, Minister, sure. um, I agree that we need to change mindset. We'll get back to that, precisely how we do that um, in the future. Um, but I want to, to bring Esther in at this stage to, because I'm curious as to her, as a young entrepreneur, her personal experience with the issue of race, racial discrimination um, when I look into the audience, there are many of you I've been to meetings with 20 years ago um, and fought these battles many times over. Uh, so most of you are seasoned. Uh, so I'm wondering about the experience of a younger person. Good night to all. Um, I will first say that I don't know if I'm lucky, I don't know if I'm blind, but I'm not experiencing at this point in my journey any discrimination at all. Um, I can be honest to say that when I initially started this journey, I went to the trust loan 
I was successful. I went to Fund Access, I was successful. And thus far, Fund Access has carried me throughout this journey seamlessly. And my passion has grown because of their support, to, to be very honest with you. Um, when you spoke just now, I represent education. So from my perspective, I am looking at my children and I'm looking at the curriculum. I'm not debating what is happening within the government. I'm a private entity, I'm on my own. So therefore I make the decision. As I was sharing with Mr. Alcock um, a few minutes ago, I've made the decision to change my my curriculum to reflect more of a global perspective because everything that we are having a conversation about I too sit in those shoes where I am tired of hearing the talk so I no longer put myself in the space where I hear talkers because as far as I'm concerned if you want to talk just put a little music then let's dance you understand so for me, I'm a doer. So what I am doing is I am pushing myself, hence me doing my master's, hence me doing courses that will put me in a position where I in turn can help those around me. So for me, I think that as it pertains to going forward, hope I have not no. crossed too far. Well, we get to the future, but no, you, okay. go, you go forward. Um, <laughs> I think that if we can focus on getting these same young people involved in a conversation, I think too often we are looking at the wrong picture. We are looking at the bruises. But the question is, what is causing that person to go into that rage or into that emotional place or mindset to be in that place? We're so focused on grandma and granddad. Granddad did everything he could do to make sure that I'm here. He's asking us, so why aren't you moving forward? Why aren't we taking what, we, what you have done and move forward? So my question is, how can we take those around us, those same persons who are within the um, same sector that may be looking to leave, I have a question. What is it that you're going out there to find? How can we create that entity here and then spread it across the region. How do we go about that? That's where I, where I sit. My question is how do I take my kids and put them in a place where uh, international primary school curriculum is now the norm across Barbados, across the Caribbean. That way negotiations are happening class. So rather than you having a normal comprehension class, you are having a negotiation t type of a conversation. What's happening here? You're having social skills being met. You're having emotional skills being met. You're still having your comprehension and you're having them engage in a conversation where they're interested in. I'm teaching a little boy. He has dyslexia. I'm trying to get him to understand one plus one is two. He's not getting it, but he loves horses. So from the time I say, John, you have one horse. Mary is give you another horse. How many horses do you have? You have two. And I'm like, yes, you have two horses. So my thing is meeting kids where they're at, giving them basic information as to where we are going as a country, helping them to embrace their culture, their heritage, and moving forward is my thought path. Okay, so thank you very much. I think we would all agree that going global is yeah. for the future. Yeah. Uh, there, there a quick follow up there on what Esther just said. I hope you don't mind me calling no. you Esther. I prefer Asian personally. <laughs> um, I want to talk about this enterprise growth fund, fund access model. I believe that we have inculcated in the people's mind, black business mind, that that is the solution. Um, we, we create these models to give more and more debt, and it's the easiest way, theoretically, to get capital in some people's minds, but it's the hardest way for us to access it. 
no business sector in my mind can thrive unless a capital market structure is developed where equity-based um, investment takes the lead. And all of our business, mine, Mr. Nasa, maybe um, Dave Hines, et cetera, David Leacock, all of us would have had our grounding by having some bank as our business partner for the most part. We need to go towards equity-based investing if we're going to go to another level. And Don would have to tell me, because I know there's some sociological issue as to why black people don't trust each other to invest together. But the reality is, young Esther here, as she's been described by the MC <laughs> right now, by the older MC, uh, <laughs> has started what seems to be a wonderful journey of educational entrepreneurship. I was telling her my daughter is about to start an international baccalaureate program in Costa Rica. And I suggested that she should look into that model because why can't that happen here? I mean, yes, it's at Codrington, et cetera. But to the minister's point, it needs to be exportable. Now, for her to get to the skill of export, she needs capital. But she can't afford the debt. Additional. Yeah. Right. And you got to pay back Enterprise Growth <laughs> Fund or be one of those persons that default. Mm -hmm. But People need to be able to pool money in the old time way, in a structured way, and we need to find a way of embracing young entrepreneurship and old entrepreneurship because my business is struggling now because we are captives of debt in an environment where our reserves mm -hmm. would have been sapped up in this, not just the pandemic, but you really came in coming through from a financial collapse in 07 forward. So all of us in business have had a hard time for the last 20 something years, almost two decades. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot to stay in the game. And we have had a relatively easy time out of our 61 years, 30, 40 years, we've had good relationships with banks. But back then, the fellows would tell you, you used to get asset-based lending quite easily. You had an asset. You get to the bank, you get some money. Now the fellas want cash flow based lending. <laughs> so the, the product needs to show success. But you can't really get success unless you got the capital to drive it. So it's a chicken and egg scenario. So what we need, you need everybody to put $100 in the pot. And say, well, okay, we have a model here that looks good. Let's invest, but we don't just give money there. We create a mentorship. You get some of the retired fellows who just enjoy sharing their stories to sit down in the room and let them be the ones, minister, for them to say, well, okay, based on what we have challenged this person, this seems like a good business bet. Don't let Enterprise Growth Fund Board do it or fund access because respectfully that's political. They're going to send down somebody from some constituency and say, look, um, this looks like a good person, see what you could do. And it may happen. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. <laughs> but when you're talking about scaling it now, it becomes a bad thing because it may work for an artisan, a hairdresser, whatever, but someone growing a business, looking at a business model that can scale. Let, let we need that access to finance. No, let me and you need in. to make sure it's not political. It's not your party or the DLP or whatever. It's just the culture. So I'm not saying it in a well, Before you jump, no, before, no, you no, jump okay. before you jump, before you jump. I just wanted to segue I, to I, her point there. Well, I, right. It's a good segue because I wanted to get um, to the point that you were making, which is uh, the next section, the reason for business failures and how much of that we can attribute to incompetence, internal incompetence, lack of capital, or um, discrimination. Uh, and just a clarification, though, Enterprise Growth Fund does do um, equity. Uh, and originally, they were set up to do equity funding. Um, but Timothy, who, who I don't know if Timothy still, hmm? and, grant and grant funding. So I don't know if Timothy still heads it. But when I spoke to him once and asked him why are so many people complaining they can't get equity, and he's saying, well, the problem is that the people that want us, we don't want them, and the people that we want don't want us. Um, which means that if you have the money, you don't want um, EGFL funds, right? 
Um, but the, minister, and then um, yeah, John. I, I, I wanted I wanted to jump in because I can speak to it both from the level of a minister and also having been president of the SBA. Uh, Mohammed would remember that years ago, um, Owen Arthur had seen the problem that really, if businesses were to thrive, they needed equity, they needed venture capital. But the, the problem with that is that your population does not have a risk appetite. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the stock exchange, for example, the Barbados Stock Exchange does not move, not for, not for thy kingdom come. <laughs> because people just are not comfortable. They don't have enough knowledge to do it safely. They're risk averse. And this has been a problem for us. And that's one of the reasons why our ministry has started the financial literacy training, recognizing that if you're going to build a culture of investment, you've got to break the mindset that makes us reluctant. Every entrepreneur in here can tell you that they have relatives that have a few dollars who would not be prepared to put that money in your business, but if they um, take you up for debt and they have you before the court to put you in prison, they would run quick with the checkbook, run to the bank, get the money, and come to help bail you out. Now, when Owen Arthur had started the, I was president at the time, um, they started, just before I came on, they started the SBVC, the venture capital. It was so hard. What did our entrepreneurs say to us? I don't want a boy telling me what to do. Because business was seen as an expression of self. People felt that a business was there for them to do as they think, as they please, whatever they want to do, not recognizing that a business demands of you that you deal with it and treat with it in a particular way. It doesn't allow you to do as you like. It will break your back if you do that. Mm -hmm. So that was the struggle. And then when people could not get the business off the ground, they didn't want directors on their board, they didn't have formal structures for corporate governance. That was another weakness that was there. The, the, the lack of knowledge as to how to run and manage this company properly, how to let other people provide you with the professional skills and information that you could not possibly have and you don't breathe it in from the air. You have to learn it. You have to, you have, to have experience in it. So that was a problem. So it kept Barbadian Enterprises within borrowing money, borrowing money. The problem is that when you run a successful business and you've borrowed 100,000, 200,000, when you need a million dollars and you want to do it by a loan, it is going to kill you. I won't call names in here, but we know businesses that when they went to that level and went and borrowed money, having to pay back every month killed them. So what we're doing and it's not easy because it means it's, it's more than just, and we had to learn that the hard way. We thought that by putting the venture capital that people's mindsets would immediately shift and come. It doesn't. You have to walk with the people step by step. You have to hold them hand in hand. You have to start and train them and talk with them. That's why you have the financial literacy training. That's why it needs to be in the schools so that you begin to build the people who are comfortable, one, with doing things with each other, which we're not don't want to talk too long, but going back to the university, how many students have you heard say, I hate working in groups. I prefer to do my work myself. Why? They don't like the dynamics of groups when groups butt heads. We don't know how to solve conflict among ourselves. And it becomes uncomfortable and toxic. And so we pull away. So the same thing happens in business, and that's why it's been difficult to have the cooperatives, to have people working in groups, joint ventures, and so on. This is a challenge, and until we break it, we are going to have a difficulty in building enterprises that can live for years and years and pass from one generation to another. Yeah. I, I think so long, but, but that was in there. Yeah, I think Don and then um, Nancy. Mm -hmm. But remember, though, that. I don't want to stray too far into general business issues. Uh, I'd like us to, to stay focused on um, issues that are particularly that are specific to black enterprise. Um, I know in many cases it's one and the same, but 
Don't on me. Yeah. Don't. <clears throat> yeah. Um. A lot was said between the last time we spoke and now, but um, I'm gonna pick up on the thread by Sandra because um, I think she's touching. You no, know, she's grappling or wrestling with the things that I'm. I'm also thinking here, wrestling with as well. Um, about those difficulties in those relationships that she's speaking about. And I think um, if you have to look at it with a long run view of history, C.R.R. James reminds us that the presence of the West Indian middle class is 1940. A West Indian black middle class will only emerge in 1940. So all this steep learning curve that we're going through, all this lack of cohesion and co cooperation and so on, we are only five generations removed from 1940. And if you're going to be talking about any successful uh, questioning black businesses, failures, and successes, you have to grapple with that history. You have to rule through the fact that uh, without intergenerational wealth being generated over the last five generations, how do you expect that these businesses, in fact, I find fascinating that the businesses that would survive are those that did not function generally within the circuitry of commerce that merchant capitalists predominate, where merchant capitalists predominate, white merchant capitalists predominate. And that is the funeral, the funeral business, mm -hmm. the business of burying the dead and so on. You can go back, look at some of the names now, the Griffiths the, 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 and so on, Downs of Wilson, and you go back and you see at least two generations of black people involved in that because that is an area that white commercial elite and the old traditional elite and the East Indian traditionally were not necessarily interested in. It follows too that within a capitalist system, let's um, temporarily rest the issue of race. In a capitalist system, as one or two of you alluded, entrenched firms will not allow startups to thrive in that environment. Okay, they will use all kinds of price rigging tactics that uh, the legislation does not cover. They will use the insider trading that continues not to be policed by adequate legislation, where they know what is happening in, in terms of investment choices down the road by another company, so they start to prepare accordingly. If you're not coming up with legislation to stop interlocking directorates mm -hmm. from being a part, a feature of how we do business in Barbados, one guy sits on this board, uh, 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 with a business and sits on another and sits on a third and goes and advise his private interests that these are the decisions coming down. This is the warehouse that's going to be sold. This is what you can do pre pre to prepare to, you know. All this is the, what my West Indian brothers, I think, call the babal and the confusion that operates in our uh, still very limiting and limited capitalist development right here in, in Barbados. So, some while it is safe to say that the life chances and the business chances of, of blacks are overdetermined by race, it is still important to acknowledge that within the limited capitalist development that Barbados has presented over the last um, 200 and some, something years, 350 years at least, within the very limited uh, capitalist development that we have seen exhibited, that the few entrenched players, including the funeral parlors and so on, hold on to their dominance and will not allow others to necessarily get in. I see Jane's husband's here, another star, like Muhammad Nasser. Uh, I don't mean to bottle your pardon? Lily Cox. Lily Cox. But I mentioned James because I wanted to say something. I mean, we've had conversations over the years, particularly when it was chair of BIDC, um, his solar technology business. Um, let's face a fact. Let's face facts. When he went into that niche area, there's no entrenched business interests, landed interests, or traditional interests uh, rooted in providing solar, t solar water heating. So, which is not to say that James' husbands and company did not work hard. Very hard. They worked very, very hard. They had to grapple with banks and, and so on. And the whole problem is being raised by El Cock about um, the dangers of bank lending mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, and so, so we acknowledge that. But, in the, but when it came to a specialized niche and know-how, he had it. 
And that wasn't something that you can necessarily, well, they can hear the idea, it wasn't something that they could necessarily steal. And it comes back to the sister's comment earlier. If you've got a niche that falls outside the traditional spheres of business, and you own that, know that, have a passion for it, and so on, the chances for success are richer. And my final point is curling around, and I must name it and call it. Just as we are grappling with white privilege and the way it works to stymie black business enterprise, we must also grapple with male privilege. Can, can you male privilege. Can you explain? And I'll explain, explain with male white privilege. privilege first. Because I everyone, think everybody here understands that. Um, white privilege. Well, okay, we were just speaking for quite some time about the influence of white capital, the influence that it has. And obviously, that person walking into a bank is seen as a truth teller, is seen as somebody worthy of risk, and so on and so forth. You have white capital, right? Uh, I don't think I need to go into that much more. We know that, we know how these islands were formed and so on and so forth. I want to deal with male privilege. Now, my colleague Jonathan Lashley, so I'll give him the credit, working in the South Arthur Lewis Institute, has been the leading researcher looking at women entrepreneurs. And what is found is that a number of women, because they are women, face barriers to success in business. They're not taken seriously by the loans officers. They want them to marry, get married to a man, and then the man and that person come in to get the loan. They want, they ask them to, to um, uh, quite often women have to front up the business with men so that the, the bank doesn't know or the others don't know that they are the, they are the real owners of that business. And, 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 the, and I don't want to go too long into it, but I hope you get the point. This discussion that speaks about the ways, the barriers to business that are outside the, the normal struggles that you would, a business would have when competing with others need not only dwell on the issue of race, but also look at the issue issues facing female entrepreneurs. There are barriers that face them that we cannot just invisibilize, sterilize, de de deodorize, and sanitize, right? We have to, just as we deal with the messiness of black business, we have to deal with the messiness that confronts female entrepreneurs wherever they are and regardless of their race. That's just one of the uh, things coming out of his research, that they do face, as women, real barriers. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, when I listen to some of this talk, I know everybody here would mean well and would like to see us go forward. Let's face the facts. A white woman, a white woman married a black man in Barbados. The black man go to the bank to get money and they refuse to let him get money. And his white wife will go the next day and get the money. That's Tell me about work. Okay, no, fine, good. No, well, let me explain what I want to, what I want to say here. It doesn't, make, it doesn't make the issue of no, 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 female I'm, entrepreneurship go away. No, it just shows that the people and, in control are in, crazy. You go on. The people who control the money, crazy. Because here it is, what you're saying, I understand, sir, you know. But how can a, man, a, a woman married, a white woman married a black man? He, he goes to the bank with good proposals, everything, and get turned on. The next day his wife go, and this is no joke, I get the money. No, let me explain something. I listen to a lot of talk here, just now. see. I want you, this country to understand, this country to understand, that the first entrepreneur that sent furniture all over the Caribbean was Mohammed Nasser, see. I didn't know Mohammed Nasser then. And then Curtin, Hampton, Jordan, all the fellas. And we used to have, I used to rent, a, a whole hotel floor. That's the kind of money that we used to control. In this country, we're black, white people and black people, what you know? But listen, do you understand that the moment the government changed and Thomas took over the government, and you know what he, oh, by the way, Hampton did a guarantee that near $5 million over to it in Trinidad. Curtin did a guarantee that nearly $3 million over to it. I can tell you that it will be about five, and we can't get our money. But let me explain what I'm saying. We were doing well in the Caribbean, all the things I just talked about. And I work out 
Now, when the government changed and Tom Adams took over the government, by that, in those days, let me tell what used to happen. You, you, you would know this, and I show you all the ugly body here. Don't buy best set for the young lady here to do. The government, if you want a building, wants to start to expand, will put up a building on a lease purchase arrangement. So even if you're working and spending all your money, you didn't mind because you got a chance to own a building in 10 years or whatever time it was. They didn't have 10 to 12 years. So you invest everything and move. You don't worry about if you make him, uh, if you're building up money in a bank, you know that you're building up money in that building and things was going good. When Tom, and by the way, when Tom Adams took over this country, he stopped that. Instantly, there's no more lease purchase arrangements. But then all the money started to pump into tourism. You think that was an accident? I want you black people to understand in this country, white people think two and 300 years down the line. Black people, they don't think today and tomorrow. So white people work out that this young group of black entrepreneurs, Sandra husband, Sandra Hooper, Hooper, Hooper. Was, right, mm -hmm. was in there. And I mean, there were about 50 of us. And we used to flood the Caribbean. They could not compete. We used to bring more foreign exchange in here than tourism here. I want you people to know this here, because a lot of you too young. And Tom Allen stopped that. And then they start pumping money into tourism and give it to tourists, every tourism, everything they want. Everything in this country, school furniture, office furniture, hotel furniture, everything used to be made in this country. And we used to dominate the area. And then Trinidad and these people realized that they can't compete with this little country here. They shut their markets to us. Do you all remember? Any of y'all know that? And you know that Thomas keep our market open. And then here a lot of big fellas that went to school long talking about but we can't run business. I mean, we dominate the Caribbean, we can't run business in university, come university, we can't start nothing. You know, we got to start to face up to this country, what's going on. And let me tell you something else too, sir, and everybody here. You see these civil service? Don't nobody fool you. Our black business people are being sold out all the time with the majority of people in permanent positions in this country. They sell the black people out. They block them from getting work. They set up all kinds of systems because they get, they could get, they may get some porridge from the white masters. We got to start playing, stop playing games in Barbados. We need to sit down and have a talk in this country of why well-educated, intelligent black people are not making it and any kind of white man can make it. I mean, we understand. They don't do it. And, and I can say this too. You see Indians? Are you hearing me keep saying all the time? The reason why I do not say anything negative about Indians is because that's exactly what they are doing is what we should be doing. Indians support each other. Listen, I not only support each other, but they support a lot of black people in Barbados too. We got to start accepting reality. There is a fear. I don't know what it is. I, I know where it is, but I don't tell you sure. <laughs> There's a fear in white people that if they allow black people to function, I think I say their children will start to relate to the black children and they will not produce white people no more. Well, these kind of people don't like to hear what I have to say because it's the truth. There's no white woman and white man and black man who come together and produce a white child. These, it can't happen. I have three grandchildren, all three from white people. I let the prettiest children in the world by the black, they can't be white. <laughs> and I know all these things, and we have to get people to understand. You don't have to, look, you take the minister here. I know if I ask you to do anything, she could do it, she'll do it for me. I know that. But let me just assume, and I think we're some kind of family too, but let me assume that that was not so. But she's a minister, and, 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 and she looked good, and, and, and I try to look for a woman. She's got to be able to help me and say, I am not the woman that you want, though. What is happening in Barbados is that, look, they have people in here, they might be friends to say that 
where black people mobilize and start to put money together to import in bulk. And the banks in Barbados stop them, tell them they don't stop it, they won't get a cent from the bank. You know, I, know, I, I don't want to in here, but I, I won't let them expose themselves. But the truth is that these people set up systems. You see all the foolishness going on now where you can't get checks cash at the bank and then you think that's you think that's an accident. Eh? That's a plan to make sure that black people don't succeed because the white man can get his money. Up to Friday you try to get a check cash for thirty five hundred dollars and could not cash the check and a multi multi millionaire the check belonged to come from. And the bank said if you don't have no account here, you can't get this check cash. That is to destroy black people. You all play, you all don't understand these things. It is to destroy black people. And what happens here is this, you know. A youngster don't start a business. He employed three fellas, he got a little job, he get paid. He get paid with a check. Go on to Nova Scotia Bank. Nova Scotia Bank, we ain't cash it, you got an account here. He don't start, he gonna meet them three fellas that he employing, when he go back and tell him he ain't got the money to do you the first thing they they're going to think, man, he's a lie, he get the money, man, and he ain't want to pay me. These things are set up. There is a fella in, 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 in um, MTW. When Michael Lashley was Minister of Transport and Work, Michael Lashley said, I, these two governments don't give me the work. No, I really don't care because I live in They can live ready to give me work or not. But, but Michael, Michael Lashley told the, Michael Lashley told the guy, give NASA some this work, this road, grills and gate and, you know, and drain these things. And he told, he's one engineer, you know, he told Michael Lashley, you know, I'm saying, yeah, work NASA because NASA don't do the work good. There's no man in this country that could do it, that no metal industry better than me. No man nor woman. So Michael Lashley called me. He said, NASA, I just was trying to get some work for you, but the engineer said, man, that you don't do the work good. So I explained to him, I, by the way, by the way, I've never done a grill for them yet, you know. I mean, to this day, all the work that you see doing, by the I've never done a road grill or well cover for MTW. Even when it was getting real work. That's a, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but we want to move, move quick. One second, let me yeah. cut this here. You know, you know what Michael Lashi told me? He said, no, I said, the reason why I call you, because I'm a lawyer and I know that something was wrong. So we, but we are playing and making sport and fun access and all these kind of pretty things. And people over there making sure that black people don't progress. And the government got to find a new, and then we go on and explain some programs I recommend that should be done in this country. So I don't think there's no one love you. And I, I come here tonight to impress somebody in here, because probably all y'all here know me. So therefore, I come to impress somebody. I come to tell you that your all children and grandchildren is in serious danger in this country if something fundamental don't change. Uh, Mr. Nasser, I, uh, well, I, I, take, I take umbrage a little bit to some of the things you just said. From the perspective that I'm a youngster's so you'll find. My father's a little older than you. He's still around. We have to be careful in my mind with how you use words to destroy the same black people. I know. And when you can make a statement that the civil service in this country and the civil servants in this country have um, on the mind uh, business, many black business in this island. I can also make a statement to say that a large part of our success came about because of civil servants. But we know that. And I'm just saying to you that the overgeneralization that is used sometimes in language by persons like yourself is also harmful to the growth of black people. Well, and yeah. I'm just saying that we need to either be in the journey together where we recognize that there are always going to be some bad apples in a group. But we have a tendency to generalize. Politicians, when they're in opposition, 
generalize that all business people are who win a contract are corrupt. Corrupt the government. I never hear politicians, well, all politicians say that either. I, hear, I say when they're opposition, but yeah, they have a way of trying to promote that if you got a contract, you could only get it because of X. And that's disruptive to the whole system because we don't <coughs> do things necessarily on merit. And it leads to the same distrust that exists in the community as to why businesses can't grow together. There's a nexus, there's a symbiotic relationship to that thinking that we need to eradicate. Because if you're going to go after and grow your business at a level, and you need to go to a different level, you need government support, like it or not. It's a small society. You need government support. No company can get to a different level unless they have government facilitation. People automatically say, if you go from here to here, he can only get so if he agrees some minister hand or what have you. And most ministers I know will take a call, engage you, and try their best to put you in the right direction. There are a few that their hand may be a little slippery or what have you. You know any of those? I have known some of them. <laughs> I have not had the pleasure of hosting any of them. But it's a fact. It doesn't, as you say, it makes sense now. It's a, it happens in any society. <laughs> the reality, though, is the more, that the, the more businesses that try to keep their businesses above board and the more collaboration we can have, it's the same civil service, in my view, that will help it to move forward. And I just wanted to Before we go to the point, I We owe our middle class structure no, to, the, to a good here. middle class. Hold on, hold on, hold on. That's that's all point civil point servants, I hope you know that. He made it sound that way. You can. Huh? He made it sound that way. Well, if you talk about that way, that's all right. Right. It don't bother me. I don't have to apologize. I did not say all civil servants. with all due respect, as a young female black woman, I am in a position after you just spoke, literally, like, should I continue? Is this country that I am in, that I am fighting for, so, let's choose my words properly, illiterate in the dark ages of common sense that we cannot find a way to go forward? Are we so blinded? Yes, I agree that we do not know our history the way you do. Um, I understand that there are certain things that we, we may lack, but my question to you would be, for me, how do I move forward tomorrow? What do I do next week? Well, things must be put in place for you to move forward. Like let what? me tell you. Okay, what? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you a few things before you respond. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to give the audience some sense of this truth, we actually do have a structure <laughs> that we're using. <laughs> if, if you um, if you notice the 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 sub the subtitle of the heading was um, struggles, success, and the future. So we have just done struggles, um, somewhat. I think we're going to skip successes a little bit because I want to get some questions from uh, comments from the audience. And now we'll continue into the future. So I'm interested in hearing from the panel how the, the very question that Esther put, um, how do we go forward um, from here? And also while you're at it, answer the question about how do we fix the issue of trust amongst each other? and some of the entrenched legacies of enslavement um, that involve self-esteem, business confidence, and so on. So if you could, and, and, and touch on a couple key government policies that are necessary to move forward. So for example, at one point, I think both governments, I can't remember, both administrations um, promised 40% of um, contracts to small business people and so I don't think that ever manifested but how do we go forward? <laughs> listen, listen, listen. The first fundamental problem in Barbados is that the government on the, any government so this is not talking about this it's not government because we go talk about government all the same you know a government take over one group of people take over the government 
from another group. They'll try to improve it if they can and make it better. And somebody take over. So when we talk about government, don't let's talk about two political parties. We talk about the government of Barbados. And the problem I said in this country already, and support the black man, the late support the black man, and um, put the first. And when we used to export, I may say we made the country. We used to have problems getting pay. Not, not getting pay such as getting the money, but what happened by the time you get the invoices on and the goods go and you clear the bank, you used to take a couple of, sometimes two and three weeks. And so Courtney Blackman put a system in place that as long as the, as long as the bills are laid and everything is in place and the goods go aboard the ship, the next day all money, the, the central bank will transfer the money to our accounts. And, I, and this R is not my business, this is business and Barbados. If the, the only way that, that you have a problem is if something go wrong in Trinidad, the possibility if something go wrong that they will debit back. So I'll take back the money out of the account, right? Anyway, I said to this country, and, I said, and everybody here who like to listen to me sometimes or don't like to listen to me sometimes. They have to listen not to want to listen. <laughs> yeah, you see this is all the things that you fellas went to school long just don't remember. But yeah, you have to listen not to want to listen. So anyway, I said to the government of the day, why don't you put sixteen million dollars or something at central bank? When the government when you do work for the government you don't always get paid early. So it sometimes it takes weeks, sometimes months to get the money. But you know you can get the money. But for a small company, you can't afford to wait that kind of time. The big fellas could wait. So what the decision was, what I said, put money, six, I, I, I even call the figure, $16 million in Central Bank. And when, I, when we go to, to collect our money, the, the, the government department would check and make sure everything is all right, sign it, stamp it, whatever well, case may be that it is approved and everything is good. And we come down to the central bank and we should be able to get our money minus, minus VAT. Because I can't understand how government is paying people VAT and then try to get it back and say the dishonest when they can't get it back. So minus the VAT. So therefore, when the government now is ready to make the payment, they pay the money straight to the central bank account. And that money will start rotating and the government will get a lot more money to you. So I recommend that. When Thompson was prime minister, just like how we have him there, we had a, every year, and you don't have more here because he didn't survive too long. But the first thing he did was to call a meeting to all, before all the permanent secretaries, the assistant permanent secretaries, chairman of boards and deputy chairman of boards and I was a deputy chairman of a board. So at the meeting, he talked and talked and talked like all politicians do, mean well, you're a prime minister, you want to make sure the country going good. And when he's finished, he asked for question time, and nobody got up. So when I go to get up, the chairman of the board to hold me and tell me, don't get up. I say, listen, you're chairman of the board, you're not chairman of NASA. So I get up, I talk to our prime minister. So I asked the Prime Minister, Tim, I talked to him about the money, I said, why money, I said, why? and I certainly said, he told us, but that money is there. I don't know if it ever went here or not, but he said if it ain't there, he can make sure it get there, but he never survived. The answer to helping small businesses is that the government break up the work, share work with more black business people in Barbados, and set up systems that can be paid when the work done. If you do that, you will see a, big change will come over the country. But you got, for months sometimes, you got bills for if the government can't get money. And, 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 and I don't think it's happened for purpose. It's just that people just don't seem to understand the seriousness of your problem, right? Or my problem, right? They, they don't understand it because they never had these problems before, but there's so much young black people now and black people trying to get into business now that the problem is there. You have to find somewhere that 
people who don't work for government, the small and medium-sized people, can get their money when the work is delivered and is satisfactorily done. And you will see a big change will come over this country. Okay, I'd, I'd like to hear from, um, from Don and Sandra and then Adrian before we get take some comments um, and questions. I think what you, what you were explaining is called f a factoring, if I remember right. Yeah, factoring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I agree with the, the, the idea that we use government procurement to um, level the playing field, so to speak, that um, government often has at its disposal uh, the capacity to award tenders contracts to uh, businesses for the provision of certain goods and services and um, all around the world in the in uh, particularly in developed countries the blaze that example in developing countries the same you you grow a new economic class to deliberate government procurement policies there's there's no magic around that that is what happens um, if you're if you're talking about United States the big farm we talk about big pharma and we talk about the big um, agricultural players and so on a lot of them have origins in um, being awarded contracts by the federal government or state level governments and building and growing from there so there's no shame quote unquote in that um, in fact even the successful businesses white businesses that we have a lot of them uh, rely heavily on tenders um, my colleague and I refer to them as tenderpreneurs and not true <laughs> entrepreneurs, but they rely heavily on tenders and, con and awards of contract. Um, uh, you know, our entrepreneurs are a very special person. Uh, I say that too as a tribute to Mohammed and James and, and, and Sandra alluded the earlier fighters um, because they were not relying necessarily on government to give them, uh, award them tenders and so on. They had to, um, water and industry and others, they had to, um, mahogany, production mahogany furniture, they had to do it on their own. I think a second thing that needs to be done in the private sector needs to come on board. All those, um, you take a walk through Broad Street and you, your eyes are always at the low floor level and, then, and, then, and in the road. But if you look up Broad Street, there's these two story buildings have, are, are empty. I don't know who owns them, if private sector owns them, if government owns them, but these, these need to be populated at peppercorn rates or just above peppercorn rates with our young people being able to do businesses in prime spaces in our capital. So um, it's just a casual walk through Bridgetown, although I think it's a, it's a city. I just want to correct you a little bit because mm -hmm. the problem is that they think it is still prime space. Mm. And it is really... Um, yeah, I, I agree. That's why yeah. I deliberately say peppercorn, <laughs> right? Because it's not really Wall Street is a, dying, is a dying city, a dying capital. And unless you get some kind of um, um, urban regeneration going on, uh, you know. But I, th I think part of the regeneration, though, and reconstitution of Bridgetown would see the use of some of these empty buildings on level two of... If, if, if you just take a walk to Bridgetown, you realize that there are a lot of empty buildings there, and, and, and I think a number of opportunities should be seized, not just to rely on the BIDC to find spaces for entrepreneurs, but whoever owns those businesses should be encouraged to uh, engage in corporate socially responsible actions, and that would be to give a number of new entrants uh, an opportunity to get that. And finally, um, something must be said about the macro economy. Now, it has been mentioned before about the limited base and growing the economic pie, growing the pie. I think part of that, to get that really done, you have to confront the bugbear that hobbles the Barbados economy, and that is its limited economic diversification. We, we, like, we relate to heavily, I agree with, with NASA on the point about the over-reliance on tourism and, and, and services and that um, hospitality services, that is. Um, these, these really should have a feedback relationship with broader um, manufacturing and design and industrial, uh, agro industrial um, um, businesses and so on. In other words, uh, the jig is up. Rather than tourism being the feed, rather than tourism being the lead, the tourism should be a, an expression of the businesses 
the tourist experience should be the expression of what we do in the orange sector, what we call the cultural sector, what we do in manufacturing, what we do in design, and so on, so a visitor gets the total and experience, art. you know, and art and culture and music and so on and so forth. So these, these areas need to grow. But so the thing is, we need to actually deepen. Now, I agree with the regional point, but you can't, you can't go regional if you're not deepening what you have. In other words, our economy needs to be deepened. We need to be doing more things than just tourism and a few services allied and around that. So as to give people a birth to first, because you know entrepreneurs go with different motiva motivations. Some of them are about being able to sustain their families and the household. So, so they're not thinking regional, they're not thinking big, they're thinking a few customers and a ability to reproduce themselves successfully with profits that can sustain them and then they grow incrementally. Um, so my thing is that we, we, we need, as the government rolls out its food security program, its energy security program, its um, things that I've heard announced recently and being pursued, you'll find that a dynamic can occur where new entrepreneurs or new entrants into these areas, aquaculture and so on and so forth, doing new and different and exciting things. So you grow the economic base or you diversify the economy and it presents a vista and a boon of opportunity for graduates uh, from Samuel Jatma, Prescott Polytechnic, UE, all sorts to, to go in and, and people with NVQs and CVQs can also find expression in this area. We can't just say grow the solar industry and watch all these entrepreneurs flock it. You'll get overcrowded, you'll get frustrated. You need to see a, a broader diversification. And I think I've said enough and I'll respond to questions. On the floor. Andrew, you want to say anything? Yes, I, I just wanted to share what some of the initiatives that the government is doing. Um, we're still sausage making, but um, you'll see the fruits of it as we um, go along. One of the things that you would have mentioned is the linkage between tourism and all of your other sectors, and at the moment that is um, working in terms of the players have all been brought together and we've started talking through, well, how can we do it? Because bear in mind with the tourism industry linked to chains from overseas, getting things coming in duty free, breaking that and building the new linkages is a challenge. But what has been a blessing in disguise has been COVID because now the uncertainty of supply right. now creates the ground, the more fertile ground for that conversation. And uh, both foreign trade and business has been engaged in that. Tourism has been engaged in that. And at the Export Barbados, BIDC, um, Mark Hill has been working on identifying the new entrepreneurs, getting them up to um, the standards that are needed. Agriculture, we just sat and talked through how are we going to be able to help agriculture to meet the standard be able to provide the cuts that are needed, what do we need to bring in? So the government is about to spend a great deal of money Cut beginning to put the poultry, the pork, and so on. And we've also discussed how we're going to get the ground provision and the vegetables and so on into the hotel system. So those conversations are going on, and the Prime Minister has positioned that, look, everybody has to carry some weight, everybody has to help take this country forward. So there is a better ground right now that is um, there. Then the other things that we are trying to do, one of the bugbears for businesses, especially small businesses, is the amount of time it takes to conduct business in Barbados and taking too long to get things done, and that kills them. I've known entrepreneurs who tell you I will not do government business because it will cause my business to fail. So this is why we've continued with the central bank. They have an enhanced guarantee scheme that allows for people to be able to get their money once they send the export, they get their money once um, Mohammed was talking about. Those things are in position. The other thing that we're doing is the um, an electronic single window, which allows a number of government agencies to be online 
to allow people to be able to transact in one place, not going from building to building, place to place, standing up for two and three hours or half day. It kills businesses. That's why a lot of businesses uh, don't meet sometimes their regulatory requirements because it takes too much time. So right now in our ministry, a new electronic single window will onboard about 12 different government agencies to make that really, really easy. The other thing would be the issue of um, access to finance. And along with all the general things that we've spoken about, one of the things we're looking at is a collateral registry. That is now in the planning stages where people can use whatever they have beside the house and land to be able to get access to um, money that they can, they, they have the opportunity then to be able to get the, the, the money that they need in order to take their business forward. Now, along with the things that you have to put in to create the ease of doing business and so on, you also have other challenges that you have to respond to because the environment we're dealing with today is not the same one that Mohammed was dealing with. So, for example, you have situations where you have narrowing policy space, where the WTO and the trade agreements and the OECD are pressing in and constantly and the IMF narrowing. As well. that and, narrows policy and the space. IMF. This is where you get a challenge now. So, governments now have to try to be very creative. So, one of the things we're doing is looking at how we can broaden the space on the regional platform. So for example, we have a, a government procurement platform that allows for anything over $250,000 must go on the regional platform so that no Barbadian enterprises don't only have access to Barbadian government procurement, but they will also have access to regional government procurement. Because what typically happens in the Caribbean if it's not available in Barbados, our next thought is extra regional rather than regional. And you have over $50 billion worth of goods and services that are bought across the region. So if we can start to keep some of that in, and this is what we're working on in the government. The other thing is a thing called the um, SimSupro, which is a central information marketplace. It's a digital platform where all of the manufacturers in the region can upload their products so that we know what is available. Now, part of the challenge that would have knocked out a number of businesses, the garment industry, the, the furniture industry, and so on, was that we could not compete with the Chinese with the scale and the, 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 the cost and so on. It, it was just impossible. So we had to keep looking at how we were going to change to be able to deal with it. So one of the things really is to look at niche areas where we can um, target those. And then the other thing has been our relationship with Guyana, Suriname, looking to open markets in Ghana, looking to open markets in Kenya, and so on. So we've started to pursue a South-South. But along with doing those platforms, we have to get our entrepreneurs ready. And this is the work now that we're seeking to do. And therefore, persons like yourself, with that forward thinking, we, our plan is to be able to aid you all in stepping onto that global space that you can begin to engage. And that's one of the reasons why I heard people quarreling about all these embassies and people that we're paying money to. The reason why we're opening embassies is to open the trade. So, for example, we just opened the CARICOM um, embassy in Kenya because we're looking to do trade with Kenya. We're looking to do trade with Ghana. I already have entrepreneurs who are already going out there. I have people who are already bringing in things. It's already happening. We want to get education across there using technology. We want to be able to um, provide the types of services that help to support their growth. Guyana is a tremendous place for an explosion right now. We're spending a lot of time and money there. So those are just a handful of the things. One of the things in answer to you, though, Mohammed, about getting your money, there's going to be a national payment system 
which stops that thing about you have to keep a check for five days on an account before it can be cleared, before you can use your money. That kills entrepreneurs. So by October, a new national payment system will be up where it's digital, where it is instant, so that you can get your money very quickly. One of the things they're going to be moving to is a payments app as well that you no longer have to walk around with money. You can go and buy your coconut water. You can do all your transactions just using the app on your phone. All of these are things that we are putting in place to help boost entrepreneurship, to help change the dynamic on the ground. It will take time, but we'll get there. Thank you, um, Minister. I want to open up to the floor. Um, we're behind time. We started late. Um, we want to finish at 9. Um, so we'll finish about 9.40 or so. And so we'll start to take comments and questions. Please keep the comments brief and uh, the questions succinct, if possible. So I saw a hand up already. I can't remember your last name, so uh, my name is Hallam Hope. Okay, my name is Hallam Hope, and some research we've done at Blockchain Business shows that globally, women are at a very disadvantage. And in fact, um, group in terms of blockchain technology, I mean, you have conferences, and very few of them are women; mostly they're men. So there's really a disadvantage, a deliberate disadvantage for, in terms of women. Now the we have a situation which, on one hand, we heard the government talking about the metaverse, getting involved in global citizens, um, educating people in uh, the areas of technology, blockchain technology, about all the global opportunities that we have in areas like NFTs, how all the creative industry can benefit from all of this stuff, you know. But my thing is that if I was to ask all of the individuals who are students, uh, primary school, secondary school, and university to come here and give us a presentation about what they know about blockchain technology, all the jobs, the careers, the op entrepreneurship opportunities, etc., that can obtain from this technology in terms of decentralized finance, in terms of staking, you have a, uh, a question. in terms of earning a lot of money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. My, th my thinking is that there is this disconnect. So, as an educator, do you have any ideas about how we can get these messages off? The students, which on one hand the government has policies for, and which can work, you know, from our, our experience that they can work. You can actually make money and get things done, but the students are not aware of the opportunities. They don't have the education. So as a young person, any thoughts about how we can get this education, all these dots connected in terms of education? That's my question. First, I will have to say that you would have to work on your educators. You have to ensure that they are trained, and not just trained, but they are trained to counsel. Because you find the, the patience some teachers have with some children, they may not have with others. So you want to make sure that you have an equal chance for each child. So therefore, you need to work with your educators first. You have to ensure that they have technology. And as pointed out earlier, we can't rely on the government for everything. They are not our nipple, yeah? So we need private companies who would seek to invest in schools, who would seek to say, look, let's take this school under our wing and we're going to make a program or maybe have someone design a program where educators are trained. The company would know this is for training, this is for the technology, this is the amount of weeks we are going to carry the program out and you test it and you see how that works and from there your kids will, will grow in that element. So therefore the root always lies in your educators because it's them who that child needs to guide them. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I assume, it's, I assume it's already to the podium. Let me just say it, it would take, you know, the, the in the scholarly world, right, 
Um, I have to say this, I don't mean to be a killjoy, but we are still many, many years away from um, um, recognizing and accepting the promise and premise of blockchain technology. I don't say this um, lately. Um, there's a healthy skepticism. And um, I know that we, we like to embrace ideas around Bitcoin and the rest of it, but it's not just here in Barbados. Around the world, um, there is still among leading and influential um, centers, both in academy, government, and I should say both. I should say in academy, government, credit rating agencies, and financial institutions, there's a lot of reticence around it because it's foundational technology, not disruptive technology. Understand the difference. With foundational technology, the learning curve is one that's based on a wait and see. Disruptive technology, by its force and nature, sees innovators grasping those opportunities and following by example. Blockchain is not silver bullet. Blockchain is not disruptive technology. It is a way of enhancing doing business and so on, enhancing how you share your data and the rest of it, and enhancing how you engage in transactions. But it is based on learning and adaptation. And the pace of adjustment is understandably slow. Hi again, my name is Carla Drakes. Um, one of the things that I would like to see is uh, greater um, innovation in terms of uh, innovation being supported um, by, say, the university. And if there are portals or facilities, um, perhaps greater awareness of these facilities that say good ideas can be taken to. For example, I go to many fairs and I see that there's a, a cosmetic um, um, kind of sector developing, um, starting out from mainly females where perhaps um, maybe it's hobbies or something like that, but you're making creams and spa items and so on. Yet, yeah, so I know that many of these things will not pen penetrate the health and wellness industry, the tourism industry, because of the criteria and so on. So to match that kind of what is developing with what it would take to have some of those products penetrate those areas instead of like when you go to high-end spas um, at Sandy Lane and so on, where you depend on, you know, the imported um, um, spa products, you know, the rubs and, the, and, and so on. So, and I think that in some cases, the, the university can fill in this gap in terms of what is the requirement, what are the things that, you know, are, that we could, that, that those kind of um, small budding entrepreneurs with the perfumes and so on, so that we can start creating products that we can consume ourselves that is, that is basically on their own starting to generate an interest. Um, the other thing, uh, and I know that this can happen from the point of view that I work with the ministry that, that, that recently partnered with the university to create technology where you can basically find where the most vulnerable persons are. And I'm thinking that if that can be done, you know, we can, it, it can be done with other products as well too. That's just my contribution. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you don't. You that's that's a very useful suggestion. One of the challenges that university face um, quickly, one of the challenges we face, so where we, can, where we can do that in relation to assisting in, in the um, finding the vulnerable, targeting those, looking at those populations at risk and so on, where we can do that in this sociological sphere, what we find is that when we get into um, bridging that gap between academic and industry, bridging those link linkages. Uh, we don't want to, people don't want to face the facts, but universities that do this well have funding, endowments and so on, where they can, as it were, establish, um, uh, what do you call it, regulatory um, kinds of, of, of centers, so that when they say this product is an authentic product, uh, was not tested on animals, and it's a f product that will not affect uh, persons, uh, except for if you have certain skin um, challenges and so on. When we say that as a university of the West Indies, it bears the imprint of authority. To, to be able to say that you need to have uh, funding something, so you need to have a professor or two funded that will come in to do that work, and whose reputation will, that people in the marketplace will respect. And that's two chairs, 
our chair, and that's a whole set of staffers. Uh, and, and so it comes down to financing. And our governments are already cash up as they are in providing the other research and uh, teaching um, requirements of the university. So uh, we have the revolutionaries, and we know that our funding model. And uh, you don't do so. We have to do so in an environment where we know there's no endowment culture like there is in other spaces. In this Caribbean space, the notion of endowments and grants to and, and people donating their their um, wealth to um, the pursuit of truth and the pursuit of science and so on, even leaving their bodies for the pursuit of scientific research, that's not part of our culture. That has to be built up. But you understand the challenge. We just can't rely on government, so we have to source, collaborate other universities overseas that are doing this kind of work and hope that there's a trickle down to UWA. You have to make not enough money. Um, <laughs> just quickly, in support of that, one of the things, Future Barbados is a grouping that has started where people who are innovators come together. They're sp sponsored by government and they're able to come together and look at innovations and look at bringing new things to market, et cetera. And Export Barbados then works with uh, people who bring products that can get out. And the issue that you mentioned about the, you know, the creams and spa goods and so on, it's an excellent area that Barbados is beginning to do very well in, in terms of innovating. What we're working on now is making sure that we have the necessary legislation, also putting in place the national standards policy, because they have to be tested so that we can make sure they're suitable for market. So that is also on the ground coming to assist and this will help you with being able to um, export. Uh, something I hadn't mentioned was one of the things we're doing with all of our embassies is we're taking them through commercial diplomacy training and helping to link all of the things that we want to sell on the market, be able to build out strategies for all of the different locations, and be able to get our embassies to intensify their capacity to promote the products. And this is how we're going to create a wider market for our entrepreneurs like yourselves, because once we remain in this space, risk averse, all they're going to do is create cannibalism on the landscape. And so we break that by breaking out regionally and using our embassies to get across the world and that way flow our entrepreneurs out onto the global stage. Oh, um, so you're going to have your question and comment no, but I just want to add that um, that last comment is probably at the heart and the crux of the, the challenge that we have in doing what Dawn said, which is deeply non-diversifying. Because what happens is that the people with the money, you know, the, we, we, we run training courses to teach our young people to be business people and serious business people who do projections and research and all that. But if they really took that to heart, they wouldn't get into most of the things that they get into. They'll just sell drinks and import and export and so on because that's where the money's made. So they take the risk, but then, you know, I don't think that government is anywhere close to the type of support that's directly needed, not through indirect facilities, but directly needed by these young people. So I think that that's probably the crux of the matter. But that's just my opinion. You, sir. Yes, good night. <laughs> I wanted to, this topic ca caught my attention, and I, because it's something that I have thought about quite a bit. Uh, so I just wanted to share a few thoughts. As black people... Can you, can you give your name first? Sorry, Benjamin Niles. Benjamin Niles. Yes. Um, as black people, we have kind of felt that somebody owes us a living. And I think that this is an area that we need to deal with. Because... You can sit down thinking that kind of feeling and think that things should just work out. I, I love swimming. And um, 
Big fish eat little fish every day. There is no mercy. People think that this life is sweet. It was never intended to be. A million sperm come down to make one child. And um, I see fish fly, and they're not flying fish. Inevitably, it happens when big fish are chasing them. We need to therefore understand that it behoves us to equip ourselves to fight, to struggle. And in, in, the, in, this, in so doing, we will grow. The effort to grow requires that we work together. This came up here tonight. And for us to start working together, we need to build relationships. Relationships involve trust. And these simple relationships mean that we learn to do small things together. And so this could start even as brother and brother. We join and buy something small. Or my brother borrow from me, and he pays back. The most important thing there is that he kept his word. We don't understand keeping our word. If I tell you that I'm going to meet you at 9, it must be 9. And if I tell you I'm going to pay you back on Friday, it must be Friday. If it is $2, it's still to be Friday. And I can't presume that because you appear to have money, that you don't need the money. These are problems that mark us, my people, my brothers, my fellow men. And I come here tonight to speak with this thing as a burden on my mind. Because this is what is hindering us, not any lack of policy. If we are hungry, if we really understand that we have to fight to survive, there ain't nobody stopping us, you know. We got the ability in it to, to, to move mountains. I have traveled the world, and I can tell you that we have it to, to there's nothing to do with size or anything. We can do it, right? So if we can just change our outlook, don't, don't, don't sit down. Nobody don't owe us anything. Yeah, I do believe that, um, you know, the, 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 the ills of slavery and the reparations should be paid. But really, if you sit down waiting for them to make the decision to pay, well, you're going to stick, right? I'm saying... Ten years can transform a person's life and wealth. And we have to talk what wealth is to amongst ourselves. You find there's a, a fear to discuss what is wealth. How much money is wealth? What money should you have when you get to a certain age that you can retire? I am in business. I was in business since I was 25 and now 58. And the first time we heard the word passive income, I see it was about five years ago. I'm serious. And um, this is just not right. I, I have, I've gone to games, sports bars, all kinds of things around my people, barbers, shops. There's no discussion about money. We sit down and we talk about who we feel got money. But we don't discuss money. We are scared to say, my man, you're getting old. You did a will. Are you, how much money you got can be coming in to take care of you when you don't feel able to work? This is the conversation that we need to have, and we need to have it with the youth. And our youth, on that matter, our children need to be built, steeped in confidence. That's the most important thing. And we can't kill them at 11. Sorry to be going on so long. But at 11 years old, you can't make a child feel it has failed an exam because right. it was determined that, that this 11 plus is your destiny. Right. We must change it. Right? Yeah. This is what is killing entrepreneurship because you feel like you feel. We must not do this. These children all have marvelous skills. If the skill is to turn the dirt into green, 
That is a skill. If the skill is to be a doctor, that is their skill. But he is no more than nobody else. Because he's a doctor, or because he has a good memory to retain academia. I'm a builder. I went to Harrison College. But I didn't meet a fella from Harrison College in no part of my development in business. All right? And this, I can therefore speak with authority as to the damage that that, that social system has on the education in this country. All right? This is just the facts. Okay, that's it for tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, you have Dave and then Joy. Uh, and why Dave is going, um, there are a few, a few premises that I would have questioned in your presentation. Generally, I agree with you, um, except that I don't know that I agree that we don't struggle and fight. I think that's about all that we've ever done. But after you've struggled and fight and you've paved the way and you've done everything right, and then one day the government, after some lobbying from um, the, the white community, puts legislation in place that you have no control over. I mean, how much you can. Is, I don't know anybody that can fight the state if the state is really, um, you, you know, we should see with COVID that when the state says something, you do it. The state says stay in your house for three months, you stay in your house for three months. Um, so um, that part, I'm not too certain I agree with, but I, I agree with your general sentiment that we need to, to battle on. Yeah. Dave. Yeah, I'm Dave Fines. <laughs> Um, you know, we talk about the struggles of black business and so on, but I, I don't think we really appreciate where we start as black business people. 65 years ago, when my father borrowed $300 from James Roberts to buy the first truck, it wasn't because he had this great vision of being a businessman. Um, it is because he had six children. He was a civil servant, a junior civil servant, and it was a need to survive. What I think that speaks to is something that is no different in the Leacock family or the Alcock family or any other business family here or anywhere else in Barbados. Um, it's not unique either to black people. There are poor white people who started in business. But what is important is that you reach a stage where you go past that struggle, you go past that need to survive if you do the right things, if you're lucky, if, as I put it, if you make the right mistakes, you go past that need to survive. And then you start planning business. And uh, the, the Lee Cox and the L. Cox and any other business person in here, I will tell you that when they came up in their family, business was discussed at the breakfast table, at the lunch table, and at the dinner table. And anywhere in between there. Opportunities were seen. Now, I hear the call for teaching children entrepreneurship, and I don't want to be disparaging, huh? but Mike Allenby, who went to school with me in London, he will tell you that all of our lecturers were retired business people, people with experience. A painter can't teach me music. I need a musician to teach me music. So I'm not being disparaging, but I'm saying that we have talent here that we are not using. I've heard the call for widening the or, or thrust to export and so on. But yet, we also heard that Indians come here and succeed. Why can they succeed and we can't? Um, part of the reason is because we don't know each other. We don't trust each other because we don't know each other. We don't reach out to help each other um, we've, we formed a group years ago called the Business Forum. Uh, Mohammed Nasser was part of that group, David Leacock. Um, a lot of other black business people were part of that group. And we reached out, we knew each other, we helped each other. A lot of people survived, were able to pay wages when things were difficult because we had something called a call. So we would call when someone is in trouble, we would call on other people and we would get funds to support them. Now, we can talk until the cows come home. There are 95 or 90% black people in Barbados. And I've said this time and time again, 
no black business should have to advertise in Barbados. If we are patriotic to our race, no black business should have to advertise. White businesses and Indians should have to advertise. But we should be supporting each other and not advocating that we ignore or boycott black or white businesses. Because it doesn't matter which ship we came in, we all in the same boat now. And we all are Barbadians, and we all working towards the same goal. But this system of black businesses having to struggle, having to struggle at banks, having to struggle um, in terms of getting their share of the market, having to struggle with the governments too, because I've heard a lot of wonderful things about what the government is doing. But I have tendered for a job for the government. I won the tender. And then I was called by a permanent secretary who told me that the minister said it has to be divided in three or four. <laughs> and my question was, why didn't they divide the 200 houses that they gave Maloney in two, five or four? <laughs> and I declined to accept the offer because I have, our company has never relied on government patronage, government favor, or anything of the sort. So I feel free to speak freely and say exactly what I think. There are a lot of business people in here that could benefit from support from the government rather than just the platitudes. I'm, I'm aware of companies that are struggling now because of that lack of support. Yet we continue as a black country and a black government, we continue to give the white companies the major contracts. Yet we talk about uh, redistributing wealth and developing a middle class. But all that is happening is that the middle class, by the pressure of the world, the, the cost of fuel, the recession, COVID, the middle class is shrinking in this country. That is where we are. And I thought those were the things that we were going to address more seriously in this discussion. So we've talked about a lot of things, but we still haven't gotten to a place where we want to know what your business is doing and what his business is doing and how we could network. I want to share one last thing with you. I have a tenant who is white. And I said to him, but how is it that every time you want, I didn't know that I had white electricians and white plumbers and all kinds of things. I said, but how come every time you have to bring a tradesman in, he's white? He says it's called networking. I leave that with you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Joy, I think Joy and then James. And we'll make James the last comment and qu question. Uh, this is a brief comment. So I have two comments to make. The pandemic really revealed a lot of things, if you're right, and if you keep things in mind. And I remember reading an article about the Goddard's company and how much money they made during the pandemic. And the article even said that the person that, they, that was in, they were surprised that they made that amount of money. And I was like, but tell me something. Who supplied her at some point with food? Who is the biggest caterer in Barbados? Who provided the hospital during the pandemic when their staff was ill with catering? Anyhow, I just left that there. Anyhow, and those questions I would like to have answered and so on. So I'm not by this panel, but generally. My question here, my specific question but to Dawn, sorry, Professor, Dawn. <laughs> Dawn. is like <laughs> agriculture was briefly mentioned in the panel. Mm -hmm. And one of the entrepreneurs' growth in Barbados right now this is within the area of agriculture. And as you're, everybody was speaking, one of the persons that I admire a lot in Barbados from back in the day, her slogan was eat what you grow and grow what you eat. And when the young lady was talking about the cosmetic industry, we are producing cosmetics, but who are we using them? Are we buying them? And for what reason? My question here, Don, two questions. One, with, I don't know if the research is here, how much of agricultural products in Barbados goes back to the ground in terms of the production and so on. How much money, monies or wealth 
people in Barbados make for non-sugar agriculture. And we spoke briefly about the whole question of making tourism or uh, uh, understanding the, the intricateness of tourism really supporting Barbadian. And how, how much of that, because imagine we're speaking about entrepreneurs in Barbados, a majority of the entrepreneurs in Barbados rely on agriculture. What is going to happen to us if we are not we importing what we eat? And what is the whole question of the, the richness that we, the wealth we can make from agriculture? You want to take James and then? Yeah, yeah let's, uh, let's take James and then we'll answer both. Yeah. We'll respond to both. Because uh, it's getting late, so we'll take James as the final question coming. Hello. Oh, Good yeah. evening. And ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, I need to just correct Professor Marshall on a couple of things. He made it look fairly simple in terms of our development. <clears throat> but in actual fact, um, there is a there's a story that is perhaps not well known in that early in the game in 1978, because we refused to sell shares to a large corporation in Barbados, we were threatened that we were going to be run out of business to form their own company. And um, corporate memory in Barbados is as such that um, you cannot take threats that lightly. Um, we had a very good plumber who told me he was stopped by, twice by the manager of the other company when it was formed a year later. And um, next thing, every system leaked. So in those days, I was rather simple in terms of my human resource. And I said, well, Emil, you must be tired, so take a holiday. And then the first one came, after he came back leaked as well. So I said, well, obviously, there's a good reason why it's leaking. So he went to work the, the place where the manager stopped him um, the following day. But the reality of that situation did not stop in 1978. For 40 years, it pursued us. It pursued us to St. Lucia, where in 1993, we started a company with Minville and Chastenay. And that company, after the first three years of difficulty, um, we ran it for 10 years profitably and um, there was no difficulty until the company decided to sell to who you know who, the same company who threatened us in Barbados, the Barbadian company that threatened us to run us out of business and form their own company. And so it took me seven years to get it out of their hands, during which time the assets dropped from $3 million to $262,000 when I took it over. That company is regarded as one of the best companies in the Caribbean, a Barbadian company. Did that to a Barbadian company. So I just wanted to clarify something to you that we did not just exist, oh, right? So I just wanted to clarify that even though you may not complain openly that there are serious problems when it comes to working in an environment such as ours. I want to um, segue into thanking Mr. Abdul Pandor, who gave us one of his one of our best opportunities at Oxnard's back in 1975, and that was the first project um, in 19, uh, we 84 houses, um, and uh, since then we've done a lot of work for national housing, both supported by um, Prime Minister, late Prime Minister Adams, who introduced the probably the world's first uh, uh, benefit to homeowners in the tax concession, um, for, and supported by Prime Minister uh, the, um, Earl Barrow. Um, so today, when we hear the government saying that they, you can put on PV panels made in China and you're going to heat your water by electricity, that is not the Barbados that we should be talking about. Okay? So the water heater should be naturally what we, what we produce and what we install. So you cannot tell me that with the efficiency and that we are number one in the world in temperature guarantee, not in te just temperature guarantee, number one in the world 
in performance BTU per thousand population. That I can show you in the, the latest edition of solar um, heat worldwide. Show you the chart. Uh, but yet we are advocating that a new housing developed by the Barbados government, the people should use electricity. I'm sorry. We shouldn't be doing that thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I think I'll use this opportunity to, um, say to, to, to do, make your final um, statements yeah. and observations. Okay, um, forgive me for shivering a bit. Um, so, to, let, me, let me get straight to answering the questions that were just put to me very briefly. In terms of agriculture and what is happening, um, both from the academic side and when I was with, um, working with BAMC, doing my public policy work with BAMC. Yes, as academics, we are required to sit on boards and to serve public policy. You have to say that because some people think that we are just theoreticians sitting in armchairs on a hill this, um, and not connected with, with what we do. We don't, you don't get to be a professor unless you have immersed yourself in serving on boards, task forces, um, boards of government and, and, and our private sector and so on. You, you, you just don't, right? Um, so you must have been engaged in, in, um, a, with, the, with this community. Uh, Predilocity is a, is a big problem facing BAMC, and we don't like to talk about it too much, except it's tucked away in the corner in the newspaper, but it is hampering the non-sugar um, um, production and the sales that the BAMC can make from non-sugar production. Everybody knows the BAMC as manufacturer of our sugar with its loan factory and so on. They don't know the successes uh, about BMC in the, in the area supporting the um, non-sugar agriculture and supporting the RV2U, which is the research and variety testing unit and so on. They don't know all that's linked back up to the BMC and so on. And um, a lot about the sugar industry is, is about the success of the BMC, but that's another topic it's related because a lot of people, when they talk about the sugar industry, um, think that, you know, they treat the BAMC as, oh, a perennial wastrel, and it's portrayed in that way, where um, the landowners are portrayed as the ones who are more progressive and so on and so forth, but everything that they do is saturated by subsidy and tax dollars support. Okay, everything, green cane incentive, research for the best varieties, all these things are offered free by the BAMC. There's no charge. If they start to let, if, if I had my way, that statutory corporation would be charging for its research services and the variety of things that they do. There was a time we were importing sugar. BAMC was importing sugar for the local consumption at, at cost lower than the cost of importing that sugar. Okay, BMC has been starved, as it were. Um, 22 cents of every euro made in sugar was to run the BMC, including the factory. You know, a lot of people don't know this is the, this is the struggle that of, of governments, regardless of administrations. You, you set up a statutory corporation to help out with, it, with, with, with um, agriculture, because you can't talk agriculture in Bar Barbados without talking about a sugar cane, Maintaining sugarcane lands and, and, and maintaining the, the non-sugar crops. You can't, you can't do that. There's no agriculture without the BAMC, sorry, or without the state, the role that the state has played through the BAMC in, in, in supporting our agriculture. But the point about you make about um, the, the benefits of that, um, we have a problem with pretty larceny in the country. The second point is that we also have a problem uh, in relation to support for what they call agro-processing. Um, there have been attempts to do things like um, flour from breadfruits and so on and so forth. Um, finally, there are some synergies between Export Barbados, the BADMC, 
and the BAMC in order to make good on those those efforts, you know, uh, how to get value added out of our non-sugar agriculture. And my final comments now to do with general, Joy, I hope I answered your question. My final comments to do with general points made um, by, by those that raise questions. I think there's a, sometimes we are not always aware of how things connect. With the drift in the values, with the drift in values in Barbados, and the, the the drift to callousness and lawlessness, okay, uh, the absence of hope among pockets of the population, raising crime, lawlessness, um, what they call a, 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 the collapse of our values complex, right? What has stood in its place is a sort of creeping values based on the 11th commandment, thou shall not get caught. Uh, we have this uh, a sense of which, a sense in which um, we want to, we think, there's the projection or the promotion of the sovereign self, I, me and me, you, you know, uh, because I'm worth it. So the, everybody's thinking about themselves. So there's a, the, the individualism, the rampant individualism or com commercialism is hurting us. What's the connection to what we're doing, what, what we're discussing tonight, the connection is exactly the appeal like by Heinz and others. This this idea of us coming together and supporting each other through crowdfunding, through purchasing um, <coughs> goods that are produced by, by um, blacks, black entrepreneurs and so on. Um, something happened between this, the slippage between citizenship and who am I as a consumer. So as a consumer, I'm being educated or miseducated into going for the best price and to appreciate foreign goods over local ones, believing in their innate superiority. As a citizen, I'm being told, oh, I have to be patriotic, oh, um, uh, I have to recognize that I'm Barbadian and so on. But the reality is that um, there's a sh drift in our values there's a loss of consciousness. We, we operate with coarse consciences. We don't ask first order questions of what it means to be human and what our development should look like uh, in the next 20 years, you know, what, are, what our development strategies should look like. And we pretend to think that with this drift in values, uh, with this slide morally, that we can somehow uh, restore social capital, maintain things like trust and so on. I'm afraid to say to you that the reality is that if we don't restore, rebuild hope in the country, we're going to lose our social capital and the things that make Barbados a unique place. And all the, the, the wishes that we have for people to act in, in a more civic and responsible way, for people to think with black consciousness and so on, um, that's going to be lost because people will always privilege or seem to grasp the, Amer the American manner of being, right? Uh, and, 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 and it's all about me and my pleasures and my brand. And that's where we are. And it's reflected in our music where we can't even, we've lost the capacity to discern what is good taste and what is bad taste. You know, we've just lost that because we need to say, let's celebrate. They celebrate whatever goes. So I am for, like, for example, I am for youth involved in the bashment rhythms. But we, like, we shine away from saying a lot of that misogyny has to stop. Right. It's linked up to violence against women and disrespect, general disrespect. You know, I agree with Gabby. We, we own the bodies and we own the street and we have a right to walk up. But I am against this idea that everything has to be sexualized. Uh, 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 in, in, that dance has to become so sexualized that you don't know when it becomes dance and art for when it becomes just something pelvic, okay? And, and like, we're afraid to just speak out and say, this is wrong, this is morally repugnant. I'm afraid. It's, we, as an, older, as an older group of people in here, have lost our capacity to speak has lost our capacity to say, to call a spade a spade, and to say it is not right. You know, um, 
I am not for any government or anything. Nothing about me is about that. But when the Prime Minister said, when in the, in the event that, in, if you could recall, there was a, a, a music video out and some dangerous and profane lyrics were being spouted by leading artists in Barbados. And the Prime Minister came out in that moment and said, this has to stop. And some artists came out following and apologized. I thought it was a signal moment in Barbados that leadership matters. I'm going to say this. We have the most powerful prime minister in a most popular government. And I don't know, the, I don't know if they're aware of the weight of responsibility on their shoulders, but they can make a difference. And where they choose to be decorously silent, nature abhors a vacuum. And the unruly elements will gain a foothold, again a stranglehold thereafter. We can't be selectively saying um, one thing and then turn a blind eye to other things. And I think the Prime Minister's voice and her interventions at this particular moment are critical because we are at a point where without leadership in a matter of about, it could be the Ukraine invasion of cost of living is that you wrote in time in such a way, it could be a matter of one year and we lose this country. It could be a matter of one year with a drift to lawlessness and, and gun crime and so on. In one year, everything we hear standing for could be lost because Barbara's just becomes too dangerous a place to be. You know? Uh, sorry for going on like, on on about th like this, but um, after hearing James's testimony of a kind of violence visited on his business, I have to recognize we live in a society that is violent. It's violent not only from the colonial experience, it's, it's violent in, in the ways in which anti-intellectualism is rife, and it's violent in also in the ways in which every solution is greeted with hostility. Every attempt to come up with a solution is greeted with hostility. Partisan discourse pollute the public discourse. So everything that is being positively done by the government is being criticized as anti mere And every time I make a critique about the way the government is proceeding in its um, peculiar relationship and, and dalliances with the IMF, I am then seen as anti-government. And it irritates me because of another kind of epistemic violence. It's a violence that targets people like me from speaking by saying, you are not in lockstep, you are not part of the echo chamber, shut up. And it's dangerous, and I, and I call it out for what I see it. And I'm saying that is just as dangerous as gun crime and lawlessness and drift in our society. And we have to reclaim Barbados in its, in its many facets. And that is why I do what I do as a public intellectual, uh, because I, I try my best. But other people, I see other examples out there. I admire the, the testimony and the passion of these entrepreneurs I've spoken before and recognize for the first time, I will ha have to admit, recognize for the first time that the fight is not necessarily with just staying alive in your business, but it's almost that like they've had to fight systematic violences facing this country, taking on various forms. Not only that, that attacks the person, but that, that attacks their livelihood, their right to survive and so on and so forth. Nasu. <laughs> this is my turn now? Final statement. Yeah. <laughs> but remember, every, sure. I, uh, For, know, that, know that it's after 10 o'clock, <laughs> right? So you've been here a little while. Well, no, I appreciate so. everything you just said, of course, it's true. The only thing I must tell you, though, is that, <clears throat> the way I would say good night to everyone again is that. There's an element of fear in this country that must be fought. And if I have to give my life to fight it, that I have committed to do. Everybody in Barbados seems to be afraid for somebody else. And yet still, there's no need for that. I want to say something, you talk about Bridgetown tonight. Um, there's a job I know going by and I say, see, every time you get people in the country that block that come with good ideas, Somewhere, somewhere, they're blocked. I don't know if the government ever said it, but he has 
a study which he documented and very beautiful for Bridgestone. Not to lick down everything and, and, and put up everything new, but how to incorporate and revitalize certain buildings and keep things going. All the pair and everything. I've never, nobody, every, nobody seems to understand that that's a serious thing to look at. So I wonder why the government has not looked at that. And please stop believing if I say a government, I mean the, the government of the day. I mean all of them, because they're all worn. Barbados is managed by government, but we change leadership as we see fit. Now, I want to also say that the problem I hear this government, this party now saying it, talking about old people. And that is also affecting this country. Because there's nobody in the industrial sector in Barbados that know it better than me, and I'm a teenager. But there's nobody that has developed as much that as much entrepreneurs have developed true as true me in this country. James' husband's yes, in, in, in solar, nobody can touch him with that. But if you look at a whole broad sector, industrial manufacturing, housing development, um, development about five different types of housing in Barbados, that's this time there. A whole set of um, knowledge I bring to this country. And you then look at people that they're old. A, a world cannot run by old or young. A world is run by intelligence. So rather intelligence than a young person, middle-aged or old, as long as it is functioning intelligent, you have to respect it because it belongs to the country. That is one of the problems, one of the main problems I find that this government talk about, or everything talking about old. Tell me, you cannot develop an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur develops him or herself, but you have to make facilities available that they can capitalize on as they go forward. So when I started my little business in Karen Village in a pig pen. And that's I remember then, we have, yeah, we have to wrap pen. up soon. Sorry, sorry, but no, yeah, three more people. I know, but could you, you know that's why we also have a problem, Barbados. The, I know. The, 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 the um, professor could talk all night, but uh, the boys can't talk. That, the, the, uh, that's why we always have, yeah, at least with me, for every. I knew, here, I knew you were going to say well, that. Let me just finish what I'm saying. You see, I but we can't stay all night. No, 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 I could stop if you want me to stop because you're the boss. <laughs> but, but what I am saying is, you have a problem in Barbados where we seem to be determining who we should listen to and who we should not listen to. And I believe that in a society, Barbados should listen to everybody. And then, like medicine, a, a professor, a, a scientist told me one time, that when your grandmother used to give you a big glass of Cersei Bush tea, she knew something was in there to help the cold, but she didn't know what it was, so she gave a whole big glass. The scientists go in, you know, the professors go in and pick out the thing that really was necessary, so it won't come a little tablet. So the, you drink a whole glass of Cersei Bush tea, but the scientists know what is it? Because they did research. We live in Barbados and hear that, oh, Barbados water good because of the coral. The coral stone do not clean the water. It's the mole on the ground that is clean the water. Now, this is sad. It's talking to me. I mean, so what I'm saying is in Barbados, the problem is that it's time enough that the government of the day actually grow into in the society, they don't mean what, but they know, they know they know all of us. And actually bring them together and let them have discussion on how to help a system move this country forward. Instead of believing that you will bring some young academic with 40 degrees out of a university and believe that that person has the ability. They do not have it. They have the knowledge, but over a period of years, they will then become superb because they will have the degrees from the university and we have the practical knowledge and common sense from the people who were there before. These are the kind of things that we won't do in Barbados. And I believe that if we decide to do those things, that we will definitely have a better Barbados. And I agree with you, Professor. 
Mr. again, finally, I say this because they know they, they want others to talk. But look, you see sending children to school to 16 years is a bunch of foolishness that they don't have academic ability. From the time they get 14 years or 14 and six months, and they cannot, they're not showing the skill to become a university graduate of Hartson College, Queen College, okay, them kind of high school, so enter a trade. And we shut down all the industries in Barbados. So what do you expect to have? You have also in Barbados, every time they put the commercial police in the paper, you put them open, I come up with headmistresses. Head, there aren't many headmistresses there, though. Had headmistresses, had masters, the, the, the senior doctors, senior lawyers. You don't know who is who, no, anyway. But the pastors in the church, the young people knew them. I mean, if you can do anything wrong, you see them. <laughs> you used to put back today. I don't know who nobody is. And that's what all this thing needs to be discussed in this country and, and, and challenged. You cannot have your senior people, the, the people who are actually out there out front protecting the country. Nobody don't know them. So if you don't know people, you can respect anybody. And these things have to change. I finished there, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, just to address a couple of matters um, and to finish up. The issue uh, Joy had asked about the question of our culture, and I know it is really difficult because there are so many things happening. It's very difficult to capture and hold people's attention to really hear a number of things that are being done. And so sometimes it may be missed, and so sometimes you may feel that something has not been addressed. However, there is a regional program being led um, under the CSME, under Prime Minister um, Mia Motley, looking at reducing our imports by 25% by 2025. And the aim here is to be able to take agriculture and be able to do the agro-processing so that we start to reduce our import bill. What this will do is assist our farmers to be able to get more from out of their efforts. And uh, this is where um, the work of the Agri-Investment Forum, which is coming up in a couple of days, they had one already, but this is where they're trying to attract people from across the region to look to invest in agro-processing here in the region. And uh, currently, foreign trade we are working with UNCTAD to get UNCTAD to help us identify out of all the products that we make in the region, what are some of the products that will have a competitive advantage that we could start to create investment opportunities around the region. Now part of what government has done in order to create the empowerment is to be able to secure part of whatever opportunity is available in Barbados to try to retain some of it for local Barbadians. And that was one of the reasons why at the WTO we never signed on to the investment part of the protocol that said that we wouldn't have local content. And that's why we're able to do what we're doing in renewable energy and in the marijuana industry and so on. And on Bridgetown, Bridgetown, there's a renewal program with the whole development from Bay Street all the way through to Bridgetown to bring back life, to bring people to live in Bridgetown, to bring back stores to service those people, to make it come alive again. And um, that's a plan I'm really keen on. The last thing, um, James has worked very hard all of his life, worked to make Barbados one of the places with the highest level of solar water heaters in the world. And we must applaud him for that. With the best will in the world, however, it doesn't matter where we live, there will always be, I think uh, someone said it, big fish will always be eating small fish. And sometimes the fish will have one color versus another. The point is that is a reality. And the only thing that we can do is to keep innovating keep innovating, keep moving our product forward, keep looking for wider and wider markets, 
because you will have those challenges. And the issue of the renewable energy with the solar PVC panels, it would be challenging. Um, I don't know enough about technology, but, but it would be challenging to ask somebody to buy solar panels to, to, to uh, provide electricity and then tell them, well, you also need to buy a system to heat water when in truth and in fact, the two things will be married. Eventually that will happen. Eventually those two things will be married. And therefore, stepping ahead in terms of innovation is going to be a very, very important thing. And one of the things that we have to do as a government is that when we're seeing trends that will impact businesses, one of our jobs is to be able to alert as well as help them to keep innovating and transforming so that they can keep pace with whatever is coming because with the best will in the world, nothing really stays still. I want to, um, and this is my last comment, the issue of the spirit of our people and their thinking and their outlook. It is true. This is where a lot of work is going to need to be done. If we're going to build a new Barbados that is able to compete globally, that change has to be there in their outlook and in their thinking. But how will we get them there? Professor Don Marshall mentioned the impact Prime Minister would have had when she said, look, th th this is not appropriate. And it did. It, it gave a pull up. Um, in that situation. But the truth is, all of us have to get up and begin to speak. What happens in our homes, what we're telling our children, the things we're saying in the public space, the things that we discuss, and so on. If we ourselves are not protecting those values and speaking those values and celebrating those values, we will not successfully transition them from one generation to another. Because it's broken, we now have to find a way to reintroduce it. And that is a problem that we're going to have to solve as a country, discussing it together and get all the best minds together. How can we tackle this problem? And how can all of us contribute to bring in this particular change? So I would like to invite all of you to be a part of it. And part of who we become in the future has to do with the type of constitution we want to have as a republic. And as you know, we just set up the commission. And one of the things we want to do is to invite every Barbadian to participate in discussing what, who do we want to be and what type of constitution will support that and what are we willing to do to be able to create the Barbados of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, um, and Adrian. Thank you, and good night, everyone. Uh, black businesses in Barbados are struggling, and they will continue to struggle despite some of having some having have had success over the years. And that success does not necessarily guarantee a rosy future. Many of us are looking at the future with trepidation because of the uncertainty that is often created by government policy on one hand, and in a, on a, in another hand, from the social ecosystem that is actually quite fragile that we live in because of external shocks that we're all facing, whether it's the the war, the I don't like to say the war, the the situation in Ukraine, or whether it's the pandemic, or whether it's the financial. Um, situation that befell us back in 2007. We're a small society. No one can even see us on the map. And we have to recognize that unless we work together in a collaborative and cohesive way, we will not succeed together. The policy decisions taken by governments, past and present, need to recognize that when a business fails, it puts more pressure on that social ecosystem. The social structures just cannot handle it. So it makes more sense in my simple mind to try to figure out how to keep more businesses going. What I just heard, for example, is that James, after 40 years in business, pretty much has to figure out what to do tomorrow. 
And at his stage of life, he may not have the will, the energy to start over again. And that's the reality. But maybe James will survive. But the families that rely on him, what happens to them? And that's true of many of our black businesses who have had levels of success. And we need to figure this thing out together. And a large part of it, respectfully to Don, maybe I'm a tenderpreneur, government policy decisions. Government is the largest supplier of goods and services, uh, pr procurer of goods and services in this country. It impacts every single business directly or indirectly. Dave may say that he doesn't rely on government patronage, but the person he moving a container for may be moving it for a government. And it happens that way, so there's an indirect impact. So unless government examines its procurement policy seriously and have consultation with people to make sure that those who can benefit they understand how they can benefit, and those who are impacted, they understand how they will be impacted, the ecosystem is going to fail. The construction sector of Barbados, in my mind, is the sector that drives Barbados. When construction is booming, everybody feels the love. Every single person feels the love. And whatever they're building for whatever sector, whether they're building plants for our tourism hotels or whatever, the construction sector needs to be remobilized. This is three, f four governments, 2008 to now, that we have really not been able to get any major construction projects off the ground of note. There have been promises after promises, and the projects just can't get going. We have to ask ourselves why. We know that in some instances, it was viewed that there was there was political interference. In other instances, we have the world order changing where maybe the financiers of those projects have gotten cold feet. And those projects are maybe not viable. The reality is, though, that businesses like ours will then have a challenge. Now, to just piggyback to the procurement aspect, I'm not sure if many people recognize that in the government procurement practices, the way a lot of businesses in the construction industry emerged was through government putting that tender in the newspaper. As a little boy, I had to t cut out the, the ads in the paper for my father. Every aspect was tendered, the electrical, the plumbing, the, the main contracting. For those who follow construction now, Mohammed Nasser would know, they put one ad out and they say main contractor. The main contractor then chooses who he wants, and hence Dave's example of the networking of the plumber and the electrician comes to fore. What that procurement ad used to do, it leveled the playing field. Because as long as I had a good price, and it couldn't say that El got screwed up on the last job, so they didn't gain me this job, it meant that they had to find a way to exclude me. And that was probably more damaging to do so than just to give me the job. And whoever contractor that was the friend had to work with me. I had to work with so-and-so plumber, etc. And we all had a piece of the pie. And in that's my mind how the middle class emerged in Barbados. That's changed. And part of it changed because government didn't have the money. And they felt that if somebody came and presented them $10 million here, let them have the say as to how that $10 million is deployed. And government has to stand up and say, no, you got to spread the joy. And that simple little process change and it has destroyed the black construction industry in Barbados, whether people recognize it or not. Subcontractors cannot make a living in Barbados that easily. So leveling the playing field, the first step to the future, Ease of doing business regionally is the second thing that has to be done. I agree with the minister. The island can't contain only all the services and products. We need to get them out, whether we're going to go south um, or we're going to go just within the region. 
We need to have the ease of doing business within CARICOM. We need to figure out how to get a venture capital process working and a fluid capital market. Minister, I totally disagree with you that it can't work because of history. I think that if we look at our regional partners like Jamaica and even Trinidad, we have to figure out why Jamaica is such an active stock market. And actually, I, I don't have the exact statistic, but I think it's probably one of the most second most active markets in, in, um, mm. in traded marketplaces. You have to wrap the age. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's a young fellow, 24 years old, Dollar Financial. I was fascinated by it the other day when I read it on the Jamaica Stock Exchange, was able to raise something like 100 or something million Jamaica dollars and oversubscribed in the marketplace. A country that some will arguably say does not have the intellectual capacity as some Barbadians pride themselves of saying that we saw bright. But somehow, it is not just the 300,000 people. It has to do with the trust. It comes back down to that factor. It has to come back because only a small subset of that market is investing. So they have to trust that what they're putting in is a dividend. And the final point I'll say speaks to black business specifically as I see it. One of the reasons why that trust is missing, I think, is because many of us grow, come up as black businesses, as, as family businesses. And our culture in the family business is to protect the family. That's the culture. So paying dividends is not necessarily first and foremost. You make sure the family members are comfortable. You make sure it's, your team members are comfortable. That simple exercise of paying a dividend is what will tell somebody that when they put a dollar, they can get it back in some form or fashion. And until we educate our businesses that Creating that culture of rewarding people through the profits of the company, the market will stay stagnant. And I think we have to find and put our minds together to how to drive that investor climate because the same white businesses, they don't go to the bank at the first round. They go in their circle, they raise the money, and they don't have that pressure that Esther has of trying to make that loan payment every month or I have in trying to make a mortgage payment every month. So those simple things, I believe, are the step stories of a brighter future for black business. Thank you. Thank you. And the youngest should be last. A lot was said, and for me, it was a lot of mental note-taking. Um, as a young person and having young ones to raise, thank you is my comment that I have to give because it's a lot. I can hear a lot of hurt. It's a lot of hurt. That's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing hurt. I'm hearing um, no one's listening. I'm hearing we're doing this, but even though I'm hearing I'm doing this, no one's paying attention to really take note because you're talking so much, but no, you need to see evidence. So if my little ones, I clearly have a serious road to look at and despite the hurdles I may face, I'm ready. Whether I'm female, whether I'm black, white, green, Muslim, pink, I'm ready. So with you as my mentors, I would look to you, I would seek counsel where I need to, but we must press on because our children need to know that there's somebody there representing them, creating a path, and it's not all doom and gloom. So my comment is thank you very much. And with that, we've come to the end of this evening's panel discussion. Um, it's just, as moderator, I just have one comment, one minute, and it has to do with the, um, with the big shark, small shark business. And I think that nobody who's a serious businessman in here or businesswoman would object to fair competition.
you know, competition business is business. I think what we have a problem with is when um, when unfair means, means that are not part of the game are used. You know, there's a story that is told of the nation newspaper um, when it wanted to expand and they brought in a print, um, a print machine. There's a story told of um, the once it got once it cleared customs and it was about and it was being lifted off, that somehow it missed and dropped. This is an important um, print from coming from I think Trinidad, and so somehow the crane missed and dropped this print machine, and, and I think that if the story is true. That's the type of big fish, small fish eating that I don't think we can tolerate. Um, if we don't have competition, fair competition, and we will fight on and so on. But um, you know, the this, this, this story in Business in BIM by Henderson Carter speaks about um, the small retailers who had 95 businesses, retail or less across Barbados, but they had to take credit from the elite commissions um, you know, being closed down simply because they were black and they were expanding. So with that, thank you very much, panel. I think that they deserve a round of applause for a very informative <laughs> evening. And thank you, audience, for coming and making this an engaging evening and making your contributions. Again, we want to thank the Barbados Library Service for, an, um, for facilitating this event. I don't know if you have any final words you want to Okay, Honorable Dr. Chantal Monroe Knight, Minister of State in the Prime Minister's Office, Honorable Trevor Prescott, Member of Parliament, uh, Mrs. Martha Ortega, Charles of Ferris, Embassy of Venezuela in Barbados, Mr. Moderator, Panelists, members of the media, staff of National Library Service, ladies and gentlemen, good evening once again. My thank you will be brief because we ran afoul of the time allocated by the COVID unit, so I will be brief. <laughs> Panelists, thank you very much for a very informative and stimulating uh, panel discussion. I'm sure that you would have given the audience lots uh, of food of thought in terms of the way forward in um, business in, black business in Barbados. And we, we, we've, we've seen that we have a long way to go. So thank you very much for your experience, your insight, and your timely discussion. Members of the audience, <coughs> Let me thank you for taking the time out to come out to this panel discussion, being a part of it. Those who gave presentations, thank you. Those who just listen attentively and hopefully would take what they've heard and what they've learned back to their environment, back to their businesses. Thank you, the media, members of staff, National Library Service, Central Bank of Barbados. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Get home safely. And God bless. <laughs>